Having found himself reincarnated into the My Hero world, our main protagonist will try to live up to his namesake. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Iron Man in MHA. Part 5. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Also, remember to check out the original story linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Third person's POV. The next morning started with a rainy downpour, but Tony and Melissa managed to arrive at school on time. They were even the first ones there. Gradually, the classroom began to fill up, and everyone started taking their seats. However, when Ida entered, he didn't head to his seat. Instead, he walked straight over to Tony's desk. Thank you, Ida said, bowing deeply at a 90-degree angle. Ha! Huh. Tony responded, looking at Ida in confusion. What are you talking about? My brother. During his hospitalization, he was suddenly transferred to a hospital with your name. There, he received immediate treatment from top doctors. Thanks to that, he recovered quickly. He was told he couldn't be a hero anymore, but after the treatment at your hospital, he should be able to return to hero work after a few rehab sessions. Although Ida couldn't see it due to Tony wearing his sunglasses, Tony blinked and shook his head. I have no idea what you're talking about. Sorry, but it wasn't me. When he was transferred, they said everything was already paid for and taken care of. Not to mention, the hospital was under your name. Could only be you. So, thank you, Ida continued, bowing once more. Melissa giggled upon seeing this. Tony gets embarrassed when he's personally thanked for doing something selfless. So don't mind him. I have no idea what you're talking about, Tony said, shrugging. I don't get embarrassed. I didn't do anything. Melissa smiled teasingly. Oh yeah? Then who sends me to accept thanks when people want to personally thank you? You're my secretary. That's your job? Not mine, Tony replied casually, resting his chin on his hand. Melissa continued to smile at Tony. Tony accepts your thanks. Accept what? I didn't even do anything, Tony muttered. Ida understood immediately, nodded his head, and gave one last thank you before returning to his seat. As everyone settled down, Aizawa walked through the door. He noticed Tony and Melissa and said, Glad to see you two could join us today after your sudden departure last time. Family emergency, Tony replied simply. I'm already aware, which is why you're not in any trouble, Aizawa nodded. Anyways, for today's hero informatics lesson, you'll be coming up with your hero aliases. Everyone cheered at the prospect of choosing their hero names. But first, the pro draft picks I mentioned the other day. This list is based on who the pro heroes believe is ready to join the hero workforce. Here are the complete draft picks numbers. Anthony Stark, 12,678. Melissa Shield, 5,212. Shoto Todoroki, 4,123. Midoriya, 3,999. Momo Yayorozu, 2,890. Katsuki Bakugo, 2001, ETC, 12,000. They exclaimed in surprise at the number of offers Tony received. Oh, to be desired, Tony said with a sigh. The reason it's so high is simply that Tony has received international offers as well, mostly from his home country, alongside Melissa, Aizawa explained. We have, Tony asked, intrigued by who might have offered. And this is where your hero names come in. Midnight exclaimed, bursting through the door. The name you pick now may very well be the one the entire world calls you. That's what happens to most top-ranked heroes. Midnight will be here to guide you on your names and make sure they're appropriate. Aizawa said plainly as he wrapped himself in his sleeping bag. As Aizawa lay down, white bards and markers began to be distributed. Tony looked down at his board, uncapped his marker with a smile, and began to write, I mean, come on. Is there really any other option? 
Melissa noticed Tony's smiling expression and grinned as she wrote down a name she felt would fit perfectly. One by one, they began presenting their names. First up was Aoyama. I cannot stop twinkling. Midnight corrected him to can't stop twinkling. Next was Mina, who chose Alien Queen, but Midnight rejected it due to its connection to a sci-fi scary movie, causing Mina to click her tongue in frustration. Tiu then presented her name, the rainy season hero, Froppy. Midnight accepted it. Kirishima chose Red Riot in tribute to his favorite hero. Jiro, earphone Jack Shoji, tentacle Siro, cellophane when it was Momo's turn. She walked confidently to the front of the class and displayed her sign. The creation hero, Genesis. Momo said proudly, this is the name I chose after much consideration. Midnight clapped lightly, a biblical name that's a first for me. I like it, she said, giving Momo a thumbs up. Next was Todoroki, who simply went with his name Shoto. Toru chose Invisible Girl, while Bakugo went with King Explosion Murderer. Midnight blinked at the name before looking at Bakugo. In what world is that name okay? That's the name I chose. There's nothing wrong with it, Bakugo said proudly. What is the matter with you? Change it, Midnight exclaimed in exasperation. Bakugo clicked his tongue and walked off the podium. Urarika, feeling a bit shy, stepped up and said, This is the name I chose, Uravity. Ida walked to the front of the class, adjusting his glasses as he announced his hero name. Tenya, using your own name as well. Surely you kids can be more creative than that. Midnight sighed, a hint of disappointment in her tone. After Ida, it was Midoriya's turn. He stepped up to the stage and revealed his chosen name, Deku. This is a nickname I've been called my entire life, so I decided to turn it into something meaningful and important, Midoriya explained, his expression serious. Midnight nodded in understanding, then scanned the room for those who hadn't gone yet. Tony Stark, why don't you come up and show us what you've decided your hero name will be? Tony nodded setting his board down on the table as he stood up. Without a word, he began taking off his school blazer, causing the others to look at him in confusion. Melissa included, who watched with a puzzled expression. Her eyes widened when she saw the Stark reactor embedded in his shirt. Tony picked up his whiteboard and gave the reactor a double tap as he walked toward the front of the room. Nanobots began to emerge from the reactor, quickly surrounding Tony and forming his iconic suit. By the time he reached the podium, his entire body was encased in the armor. He set the board down and removed his glasses as the helmet sealed over his head. On the board, it read, The Armored Hero. Iron Man Tony glanced around at his classmates, a smirk forming inside his mask as he declared confidently, I am Iron Man. Third person's POV. So cool! Most of the class shouted as they watched Tony's transformation sequence. Did you have to change into your hero suit just to say your hero name? Midnight asked curiously. Tony gave her a thumbs up with a grin. Yup, I was going for style points. What do you think? His helmet withdrew from his face as he spoke. Ten points. I like it. Midnight said, returning the thumbs up. Tony nodded as his suit dissolved back into nanobots, returning to his Stark reactor. He grabbed his board and headed back to his seat. As he sat down, Melissa gave him a small pout. Why didn't you tell me you finally made the nanobots? She asked. I wanted it to be a surprise, Tony smirked. Melissa smiled. Well, I think you looked great and very cool out there. Thank you, thank you, Tony said, bowing as if performing. Now then, all that's left is Melissa Shield. Why don't you come up and show us what you would like your hero name to be? Midnight said, motioning for Melissa to step forward. Melissa smiled confidently, gave Tony a quick kiss on the cheek, and walked up to the podium. She didn't call forth a suit or anything similar. She simply slammed down her board with a confident smile. On the board, it read, The Metal Encased Hero. The Iron Maiden Every Iron Man Needs His Iron Maiden, and that just so happens to be me, Melissa said, puffing her chest proudly. Aw, oh, that's so cute, Mina gushed, with most of the girls agreeing. Midnight, however, had an awkward smile. Iron Maiden? Like the torture device? Ah, 
Melissa turned to midnight, confused. What? No, I didn't mean it like that. Relax, I'm messing with you. Midnight smiled teasingly. I also think it's very cute. Melissa blushed as she jogged off the podium and sat next to Tony, who was barely suppressing his laughter. Real smooth, Melissa. Real smooth, Tony smirked, causing Melissa to pout at him before sticking her tongue out. Once everyone had chosen their hero names and class had ended, Aizawa stood in front of the class with Midnight by his side as she stretched. He began handing out stacks of forms to those who had been scouted. These are from everyone who scouted you. Please review them carefully and choose wisely which agency you will intern with. Tony wasn't just handed a stack. He was practically encased in towers of paper surrounding him. Excuse me, but aren't we in a digital age? Couldn't you have converted all of these into emails? What kind of bullshit is this? Tony complained. Language, Aizawa said, in a nonchalant tone, ignoring Tony's complaints. For those who hadn't been scouted, Aizawa passed out a sheet of paper listing 40 hero agencies that were freely scouting. You have until the weekend to submit your choices, which means you only have two days, Aizawa informed them. Tony, seeing he was being ignored, clicked his tongue and carefully tiptoed around the stacks of papers. He took out his phone and ordered Friday, scan this mess and pick the one you believe I'd most likely choose. I don't have time to deal with this. A light emitted from Tony's camera as it scanned the stacks of paper. Tony saw a list scrolling with names and ranks next to their pictures. He spotted a few S-rank heroes but let Friday do her thing. The scan eventually stopped and highlighted a form with all the necessary information. America's number one S-rank hero, stars and stripes. Oh, now that's interesting. Melissa, who noticed what Tony was doing, decided to do the same. Her process ended much quicker. America's number one S-rank hero, stars and stripes. You won't believe who just scouted me out. Both Tony and Melissa said simultaneously, turning to each other. They froze, awkward smiles forming on their faces. At the same time, Tony asked, to which Melissa nodded. Stars and stripes, they both said in unison, causing them to sigh. I'm never getting rid of you, am I? Tony sighed. Never, Melissa mouthed with a sensual smirk. Where you go, I will happily follow. Tony let out an exaggerated sigh. I sometimes worry about your obsession with me, Melissa. It isn't healthy. Melissa glared. It's not an obsession. I'm your secretary. The first stage is denial. That's for grief. The second is anger, Tony said, shaking his head. Keep talking. I dare you and see what happens, Melissa said, narrowing her eyes. Ooh, there's bargaining, Tony smirked. Melissa lowered her head, shaking it in exasperation. And there's depression. You know what? I'm done with this conversation. And that's acceptance. Tony began clapping. Melissa decided to ignore Tony completely until school ended for the day. After the bell rang and school ended, Tony stood up and walked over to Toru, who was deep in concentration, looking at the list of those who had scouted her. You ready? Tony asked, causing Toru to jump slightly in surprise. Although Tony couldn't really see it, Toru tilted her head in confusion. Ready for what? Your training. I did tell you I was going to train you during the sports festival. Remember? Eh? I completely forgot about that, to be honest. You remembered? Yeah. I'm someone who likes to keep my word. I find my word to be something really valuable. And since I said I'd help train you, that's what I'm going to do. Right now? No, tomorrow. Of course right now, Tony said with an eye roll. Toru gave an awkward giggle, rubbing the back of her head. Sorry, let me just pack my things. After quickly gathering her belongings, she followed Tony outside, where she saw both Momo and Melissa waiting. Sorry for being a bother, she said, bowing apologetically. Melissa and Momo waved off her concerns. Not at all, they both said reassuringly. Once outside, they found a limo waiting for them. Tony motioned with a smile. Ladies first. I've never been in a limo before. Toru said shyly as she stepped inside, marveling at the spacious and luxurious interior. There's a first time for everything, as they say, Tony replied, 
stepping in after her as the limo began to drive. Toru hesitated for a moment before asking, So how are we going to train my quirk? Tony leaned back, considering his response. I'll be honest, your quirk is definitely unique, and training it will be a bit unusual. I don't even need to scan your quirk factor to know that. Your mutation quirk causes light to naturally bend around you, making you invisible. We'll need to figure out how your body does that so you can learn to control it more consciously and deliberately. Toru nodded, absorbing the information, though she still looked a bit uncertain. It wasn't long before they arrived at Tony's house. As they stepped inside, Tony gestured around with a grin. Welcome to Casa Stark. Tony led Toru down to his lab, where she was scanned head to toe by various advanced machines. The technology around her was unlike anything she had ever seen. You aren't going to dissect me to find out how my quirk really works, right? Toru asked, trying to lighten the mood with a nervous chuckle. Tony chuckled alongside her. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Huh? Toru responded, her nervous laughter fading as she realized he might not be entirely joking. Third person's POV. The next day, Tony, Melissa, Momo and Toru were back in Tony's lab, with Toru excitedly experimenting with her newly discovered abilities. Her hands glowed brightly as she just shut off a beam of light from her palms. That was so cool! Toru exclaimed, her eyes sparkling with excitement. Yup, Tony began, explaining, your mutation allows you to naturally bend the light around you, making you invisible. When you concentrate that light, you can weaponize it into an attack. Melissa was working on the other side of the lab and suddenly chimed in, and done, she held up a belt with a V-shaped buckle. Here, Melissa said, handing the belt to Toru, this belt won't shut off your quirk since it's a mutation, but it should neutralize the effects, making you visible as long as you have it on. Really? Toru squealed excitedly. She quickly grabbed the belt and wrapped it around her waist, but nothing happened. She looked disappointed. Nothing happened, she said sadly. Melissa chuckled, clearly amused. That's because you're supposed to activate it by pressing the V-buckle, V for visibility. Oh, oops, Toru said, blushing slightly as she rubbed the back of her head. She then eagerly pressed the V-buckle, and the light around her shimmered, slowly revealing her true appearance. Everyone stared at Toru in stunned silence. Even Tony who already knew she was cute, was taken aback by how adorable she appeared in real life. She had short, colorful hair, chubby cheeks, big round eyes that matched her shiny green hair color, and a cute button nose. Seeing their stunned expressions, she tilted her head in confusion. What? Tony, still in awe, simply took out his phone, snapped her picture, and showed it to her. Toru's eyes widened in delight as she saw her reflection. Puffing her chest out with pride, she exclaimed, I knew I was always cute. You look amazing, Melissa agreed, nodding. You're adorable, Momo added with a smile. The guys in class are about to go absolutely crazy when they see how beautiful you are, Tony teased. Toru blushed deeply, covering her face with her hands. Okay, you guys can stop with the compliments. I'm not used to this. It's very embarrassing, she said shyly. She quickly tapped the belt again, turning invisible to hide her heated cheeks, and started fanning herself. Then, with tears in her eyes, Toru hugged all three of them. Thank you. I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life without ever knowing how I looked. They all patted her back, happy that they were able to help her. Once Toru finished expressing her gratitude, Tony asked, So where are you guys going to be interning? He watched as Toru fiddled with the belt buckle. I actually got scouted by an A-rank hero, Toru announced excitedly. He focuses on indoor rescue missions, dealing with hostages and the like. He said he saw potential in me during my performance in the sports festival. Momo scratched the back of her head sheepishly. I've actually been scouted by the 6th S-rank hero of Japan, Crust. Although I wasn't the only one, Kirishima was scouted too. Apparently, Toru dropped to all fours in mock devastation. Now my scout doesn't sound as impressive or interesting anymore. I'm sorry, Momo said quickly, trying to console her. 
I didn't mean to make your sound less impressive. Being scouted by an A-rank hero is a huge deal. It's really great. Momo, please stop. Toru groaned, still on the floor. Your pity is only making it worse. Melissa then asked, why would Crust want to scout you? Kirishima, I can understand. But you? Momo's turn to be embarrassed. She slumped down next to Toru, her face flushed. He was so ashamed and embarrassed by how I wielded a shield that he said he wouldn't be able to forgive himself if he just let me be. Now it was Toru's turn to comfort Momo, while Tony and Melissa tried, and failed, to suppress their laughter. After a moment, Momo perked up and asked, What about you guys? Did you manage to settle everything with America's number one S-rank hero? Tony grinned confidently. Yeah, we're hella fast. We should be able to fly there instantly for our internship. So traveling shouldn't be an issue. As the internship period approached, the students of Class 1A gathered at the station where Aizawa was waiting for them. Each student carried their cases with their hero suits inside, ready for the journey ahead. The atmosphere was filled with excitement and anticipation, but it quickly shifted when they noticed an unfamiliar face among them. Hey beautiful, are you lost? Don't worry, I know my way around here. Why don't I guide you? Mineta said, attempting to sound charming but failing miserably as his expression revealed his true perverted intentions. Toru, now visible and looking quite different from before, glared at him. Mineta, if you don't get away from me this instant, I will not hesitate to kick you, she warned. Mineta's eyes widened in surprise, and the rest of the class looked equally shocked. Urarika was the first to voice the collective disbelief. That voice, Toru, Toru struck a pose with one hand on her hip and the other holding her case over her shoulder. Flashing a peace sign, she said, the one and only, and then made a playful kissy face. Whoa! The entire class erupted in surprise and excitement. Everyone crowded around her, showering her with compliments. Toru blushed, rubbing the back of her head in embarrassment. It's thanks to this belt Melissa, Tony, and Momo helped make for me, she explained excitedly, showing off her new accessory. All right, quiet down, everyone. We're in public. Please behave yourselves, Aizawa ordered sternly, cutting through the excitement. He then turned to Tony and Melissa, raising an eyebrow. What are you two doing here? Shouldn't you both be getting on a plane? Tony smirked, unfazed by Aizawa's question. I'm the class president. It's only natural I come here to wish everyone good luck. Hiroshima, clearly touched, clapped Tony on the back. Caring and wishing everyone good luck is so manly. Bro, Kaminari, with a playful grin, added, I would have thought you'd be here just to show off or something. Tony's smirk widened. Who said I can't do both? Tony and Melissa began to step back from the group, a mischievous glint in their eyes. Aizawa narrowed his eyes, already anticipating what they were planning. Wearing your hero outfit right now is prohibited, he warned. Tony's grin only grew wider. I'm rich. I can get away with it. With that, both Tony and Melissa tapped the center of their uniforms. The fabric rippled and shifted, transforming into their hero suits. Tony's in his signature red and gold, and Melissa's in a sleek purple and gold. Later, suckers, Tony shouted as he shot into the sky, with Melissa following close behind, a bright smile on her face. Aizawa covered his face with his hand and sighed heavily just as the bullet train for the rest of the class arrived. High above, Tony and Melissa broke the sound barrier multiple times, the air around them crackling as their speed increased. Their feet joined together, causing the nanobots in their suits to form larger thrusters. They became nothing more than blurs in the sky, traveling from one continent to another with incredible speed. Third person's POV. Kathleen Bates stood inside a plane hangar, wearing a black tank top with a green military jacket tied around her waist. She was chatting with a pilot, smiling, when her radio buzzed urgently at her side. Kathleen, we have a situation over... I repeat, we have a situation. It's deemed urgent. Please respond. Over. Kathleen frowned in confusion, picking up the radio to respond. This is Kathleen. 
What's the situation? We've detected two unidentified flying objects heading your way at an alarming speed. They're clocking in at Mach 10, Mach 15, Mach 16, Mach 17. It keeps rising. They'll be on top of you in a few seconds. The voice on the other end was a mix of terror and amazement. Do we engage? Two unidentified flying objects? Kathleen's eyes widened in realization. Ha ha ha. No, let them through. I know who they are, she said, rushing outside. Curiosity peaked. Those around her followed suit, just in time to see two shining stars streaking across the distant sky. In the next second, they were already overhead, creating a massive shockwave that rippled through the area due to their immense speed. Most had to brace themselves, planting their feet firmly on the ground to avoid being knocked over. They then watched as the two objects descended rapidly from the sky, creating a large dust cloud as they landed, their figures barely visible through the swirling debris. Through the haze, they could make out two figures kneeling with fists planted in the ground. Slowly, they stood and began to walk out of the dust cloud, revealing their slick red and purple suits of armor. As they stepped forward, their suits retracted, folding back into the arc reactors on Tony's and Melissa's chests. Tony casually reached into his pocket, pulling out a pair of sunglasses as he walked toward Kathleen, while Melissa confidently tied her hair into a ponytail beside him. Standing before Kathleen, Tony gave a lazy two-finger salute, a smirk playing on his lips. Your intern's reporting for duty, he quipped. Meanwhile, Melissa stood with her chest puffed out, giving a full salute and a beaming smile. Kathleen laughed, her face lighting up with happiness as she patted their shoulders enthusiastically. Wow, look at how much you two have grown. I almost couldn't believe it when I saw you during the sports festival. One of the pilots behind Kathleen peered over, his expression straight. Did you really have to destroy our runway for your grand entrance? Yes, yes I did. Tony replied shamelessly with a proud nod. There was a brief silence before Tony cleared his throat. How much to fix it? Kathleen chuckled and shook her head. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it later. Now, there's one thing left to make this internship worthwhile. Bite me. <laughs> Both Tony and Melissa responded in unison. Surprised. Kathleen crossed her arms and smiled at them. To truly understand what you're capable of and what I can teach you during this internship, I want both of you to fight me, she declared. Now? Tony asked. After I change into my costume, we'll take it to the air to avoid collateral damage, Kathleen said, turning and walking away. Well, this is going to be fun, Tony smirked. Melissa nodded in agreement, her smile widening. Stars and stripes stood atop a jet, her American flag cape fluttering in the air alongside her hair. A large smile spread across her face. Tony hovered nearby in his red and gold nanobot suit. Small stabilizer wings extended from his back. Despite the suit, he maintained a stance of confidence. Next to him floated Melissa in her own nanobot suit, colored purple and gold with matching wings. She hovered confidently, her repulsors glowing with power. Tell me, you two, what are your hero names? State them nice and proud. Stars and stripes called out, still smiling. You can refer to me as Iron Man, Tony said. And you may call me the Iron Maiden, Melissa added. Ha ha ha. I like it. Are you two ready? Stars and Stripes asked. They both nodded, and Kathleen, without further warning, launched the first attack. Stars and Stripes lunged forward, her cape billowing like a banner of freedom, the sheer force of her movement creating a sonic boom. She clenched her fist, her quirk, new order, ready to impose its will on the battlefield. Tony's HUD flared with warnings, but his confidence remained unshaken. Stars and Stripes aimed a powerful punch toward Tony, but he zipped upward, the stabilizer wings on his suit allowing him to dance through the air with unmatched agility. At the same time, Melissa darted to the right, firing a barrage of repulsor blasts that streaked toward Stars and Stripes like a rain of light. With a swift motion, Stars and stripes spun in midair, evading the blasts with ease. You're going to have to do better than that, she called out, her grin widening. Tony's voice came through Melissa's comms. Keep her busy. I've got a plan. 
Melissa nodded, her suit's AI feeding her real-time trajectory data. She continued her assault, pushing stars and stripes to maintain her evasive maneuvers. As they exchanged blows, star and stripes' grin never faded, her love for battle evident in every move. Tony, meanwhile, was preparing something bigger. His suit's nanobots reconfigured, shifting into an arm cannon that began to hum with energy. Tony unleashed a concentrated beam of pure energy, aiming directly at stars and stripes. The force of the blast tore through the air, leaving a trail of crackling power in its wake. Stars and stripes didn't hesitate. She stretched out her hand, her cork taking hold. New order. The air in front of me is an impenetrable shield. The energy beam slammed into the invisible barrier she created, dispersing harmlessly around her. Nice try, but you'll have to hit harder. Melissa had anticipated this, charging in from behind as stars and stripes focused on Tony. Her suit's nanobots shifted, forming an energy blade that crackled with purple and gold light. She slashed downward, aiming for a clean hit. Stars and stripes reacted with lightning speed, pivoting to intercept. New order. The space around me restricts all movement. Melissa's suit froze mid-strike, the powerful quirk holding her in place. But it was the opening Tony had been waiting for. With Melissa distracting Star, Tony's suit reconfigured once more, launching a barrage of mini-missiles that rained down on stars and stripes. This time, the explosion was too close to dodge entirely. Star was forced to release Melissa to shield herself from the brunt of the attack. Smoke and debris filled the air as Tony and Melissa regrouped. Emerging from the cloud of smoke, stars and stripes still stood tall, though her cape was tattered and her smile had become a determined smirk. Impressive teamwork, but I'm not done yet. With a swift movement, she lifted her hands and shouted, New order. I'm surrounded by a cyclone of wind, a powerful whirlwind erupted around her, pushing away the debris and creating a barrier of swirling air. Tony and Melissa exchanged a quick glance, understanding the new challenge. Tony's suit recalibrated, deploying anti-wind stabilizers to counteract the cyclone's force, while Melissa prepared her suit's repulsors for a focused assault. Stars and Stripes, still grinning, used the cyclone to launch herself towards Tony, moving faster than he could react. She aimed a series of rapid punches, each one powered by her quirk, forcing Tony to rely on his agility to evade. Melissa, meanwhile, dove through the cyclone, using her suit's enhanced propulsion to navigate the turbulence. She activated her energy blade once more, aiming for a critical strike. Stars and stripes spotted Melissa's approach and responded with a fierce gust of wind. New order. The wind around me is a barrier that deflects all projectiles. The wind shield deflected Melissa's energy blade, forcing her to retreat. Tony, seizing the moment, recalibrated his suit systems to deploy an EMP pulse. Brace yourself, he called out to Melissa. The EMP pulse surged through the air, disrupting stars and stripes quirk temporarily. The cyclone wavered, and her movements slowed just enough for Tony and Melissa to press their advantage. Melissa launched a high-intensity repulsor blast aimed directly at stars and stripes. With the cyclone disrupted, the blast struck home, causing a massive explosion. Stars and stripes was pushed back, her formidable stance faltering. Yet even as the smoke cleared, stars and stripes stood firm, her eyes flashing with determination. Is that all you've got? She challenged, her voice cutting through the haze. Tony and Melissa circled her, their suits glowing with accumulated energy. Tony's HUD was now tracking stars and stripes every movement with pinpoint accuracy, while Melissa's suit recalibrated for precision strikes. Stars and stripes, brushing off the remnants of the blast, shouted, New order. Gravity around me is now increased tenfold. Suddenly, the area around her became incredibly dense, causing Tony and Melissa to feel the gravitational pull increase dramatically. Tony struggled to maintain his altitude as his suit's thrusters fought against the intensified gravity. Hang on, he warned Melissa. Melissa's suit adjusted to the new gravity, but her movements were slowed. She fired a series of concentrated repulsor blasts, but the increased gravity made them less effective. Stars and stripes took advantage of the situation, 
using her enhanced strength to close the gap quickly. She hurled herself towards Tony with immense force, each punch creating shockwaves in the air. Tony barely managed to dodge the onslaught, his suit's thrusters working overtime to keep him airborne. He retaliated with a rapid-fire pulse from his arm cannon, but Stars and Stripe's quirk allowed her to deflect the energy bursts with ease. Seeing the urgency of the situation, Melissa reconfigured her suit's nanobots into a high-density shield and rushed to Tony's aid. She intercepted Stars and Stripe's next attack, her shield absorbing the impact and protecting Tony from the brunt of the force. Stars and Stripes, realizing her gravity manipulation was starting to wear thin, decided to shift tactics. New order. The space around me is now an impenetrable barrier. She raised her hand, creating a force field that encased her in a protective dome. Tony and Melissa regrouped, their suits quickly analyzing the new barrier. We need to break through that shield, Tony said, his voice resolute. Melissa nodded, preparing a concentrated energy blast. Tony's suit adjusted, converting its energy into a high-intensity beam. Together, they launched their combined attack at the force field. Stars and stripes, inside her shield, braced for impact. The combined power of Tony's beam and Melissa's blast collided with the force field, causing it to ripple under the immense pressure. The shield began to falter, cracks forming under the strain of the attack. Stars and stripes gritted her teeth, her focus unwavering. She pushed her quirk to its limits, reinforcing the shield with all her remaining strength. Despite her efforts, the combined assault proved too much. The force field shattered with a resounding crack, and Stars and Stripes was thrown back by the explosive force of the energy. She landed gracefully, her cape fluttering as she regained her footing. Not bad at all, she exclaimed, her grin returning. I've seen enough. You two surely are strong, she said proudly. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa hovered beside Star and Stripes, who stood firmly on top of one of the jets. The hero nodded approvingly, I've got to say, you kids are strong. Not to mention you work well together, which is vital for any hero. I won't have to worry much about you two when we go on missions. We're already going on a mission? Melissa asked, surprised by how quickly things were progressing. Yes, Star and Stripes confirmed with a nod. Our exchange just now was to see in what direction I need to train the both of you. You're both strong and great fighters, but what you lack is genuine hero experience. I did a quick background check and saw what happened at the USJ. But that's not enough. Star tapped her ear and said, All right, brothers, lead us to where people need the most help. It's time these newbies gain actual experience. She added with a smirk. One of the pilots gave her a thumbs up. You got it, Star. Just tell those two to follow closely. The jets made a quick U-turn before blasting off. Tony and Melissa flew alongside Star and Stripes, who stood on the jet with her arms crossed, her American flag cape billowing in the wind. Tony then hacked into their comms, surprising everyone when his voice came through. You know, I have a satellite in the sky. It can scan the area and detect trouble as soon as it appears. Star and her pilots exchanged glances. The pilot flying the jet next to Star shrugged. He's a Stark, so I don't doubt it would work. We could give it a try. Star pondered for a moment before asking, how effective is this satellite of yours? Rather than respond verbally, Tony demonstrated. He flew closer to Star and extended his arm, projecting a hologram from his wrist. The hologram displayed a clear, picture-perfect image of two giant men fighting, wreaking havoc in their vicinity. This is the closest disaster to us currently, Tony explained. Star and Stripe's expression grew serious as she took in the destruction the giants were causing. Where is this happening? And do you know why they're fighting? I've already sent the coordinates to your pilots, Tony informed her. While Tony provided the data, Melissa was analyzing the footage from the area where the giants were battling. Star and Stripes then asked, Do you know the reason for their fight? Melissa sighed before answering, From what I was able to gather, they bumped into each other and started pushing, which escalated into a more physical brawl and then turned into a competition over who's stronger. Star and Stripes nodded, processing the information. I've seen how fast the two of you are. Go ahead of me, evacuate as many people as you can. 
but do not engage until I get there. Yes, ma'am, Tony and Melissa shouted in unison. Their nanites shifted around their legs, transforming into giant thrusters. With a powerful burst, they shot forward, leaving only a blue trail in their wake as they sped ahead to begin the rescue mission. Tony and Melissa shot through the sky, their nanite-enhanced suits humming with energy as they sped towards the scene of destruction. The two giants were locked in a brutal battle, each blow causing shockwaves that threatened to topple nearby buildings and send cars flying through the air. People were running in every direction trying to escape the chaos. As they arrived, Tony immediately began assessing the situation, his suit's AI Friday, highlighting the most critical areas on his HUD. Melissa, you take the east side. I'll handle the west. Prioritize getting civilians to safety and stabilize any collapsing structures. Tony ordered calmly Melissa nodded, her face set in determination. Got it. Her suit morphed, forming additional thrusters and stabilizers to increase her speed and precision. She zoomed towards a building that was on the verge of collapsing, nanobots streaming out from her suit to form a temporary support structure that held the building steady while she guided the people inside to safety. Tony, on the other hand, was busy using his suit's nanobots to create barriers around a group of civilians trapped under debris. The nanobots quickly formed a protective dome, and with a flick of his wrist, he lifted the rubble off them, allowing them to escape. He then turned his attention to a nearby car that had been tossed into the air by one of the giant's blows. With a burst of energy from his thrusters, Tony flew up, caught the car mid-air, and gently placed it down away from the danger zone. In the midst of their rescue efforts, Tony's satellite feed alerted him to a new threat. One of the giants was preparing to throw a massive piece of a building at the other, and it would land directly in the path of several fleeing civilians. Melissa, Tony didn't need to say much. Simply her name and Melissa was already on it. She activated her suit's energy shielding and flew at top speed towards the incoming projectile. Just as it was about to crash down, she unleashed a burst of energy from her suit, vaporizing the debris into harmless particles. Tony arrived a second later, using his nanobots to form a massive net that caught the remaining smaller pieces before they could cause any harm. Tony and Melissa moved seamlessly, coordinating their efforts to evacuate civilians and minimize the destruction left in the giant's wake. The arrival of Star and Stripes brought a wave of relief to the other civilians, but the situation was still tense. The hero quickly assessed the scene, then jumped into action. First new order. Anyone I touch will lose the will to battle, Star and Stripes declared as she leaped from the jet. Second new order. I will be able to float. With that, she descended between the two colossal giants, who were just about to collide with devastating force. With perfect timing, Star and Stripes intercepted their blows, catching both fists with her hands. The impact created a powerful shockwave, but she remained unfazed, her strength and durability evident even without the use of a new order to enhance them, as she held the giants at bay. As their fists connected with her hands, the giant's aggression drained away, their will to continue fighting completely sapped by her power. They looked at each other in confusion, their desire to battle gone. With their resistance nullified, they were quickly apprehended. Once the giants were secured, Star and Stripes joined Tony and Melissa, who just finished working to rescue civilians. You two did an incredible job, she said with genuine admiration. I didn't have to worry about you at all. With a bit more experience, you'll be among the best. Tony and Melissa exchanged a glance, a mixture of pride and relief on their faces. Thank you, ma'am, Melissa said respectfully. Tony couldn't resist adding with his trademark confidence. If I become any better, I might just steal everyone's spotlight. Star and Stripes chuckled at Tony's remark, finding his confidence both amusing and endearing. As the situation calmed, some of the rescued civilians began to return, recording the aftermath on their phones. They looked at Tony and Melissa with teary-eyed gratitude, expressing their thanks for the heroes who had saved their lives. One of the civilians, overcome with emotion, called out, Excuse us, but what do we call you two? I want to properly thank the heroes who saved my children and me just now. Tony's face mask morphed down, revealing his young face, which surprised many of the onlookers. 
He flashed a charming smile and said, You can all call me Iron Man. Melissa's mask also retracted, and though she blushed slightly from the attention, she managed to say, I am called the Iron Maiden. Thank you, Iron Man and Iron Maiden. The crowd shouted in unison, their voices filled with heartfelt gratitude. Star and Stripes smiled at the scene before her. Come on, you two, we still have more people to save today. Tony and Melissa nodded, their masks sliding back into place as they prepared to head back into action. As they floated back up to the jet, Star and Stripes glanced between them teasingly. I bet that felt amazing, didn't it? Even though their masks were back on, Star and Stripes didn't need to see their faces to know they were smiling ear to ear like little children. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa were recorded flying across America, assisting Stars and Stripes with her hero work. They helped as many people as they could, quickly becoming an internet sensation once it was revealed that Iron Man and Tony Stark were one and the same. In one scene, Tony and Melissa were seen flying around a toppled building, repairing the damage by wielding red lasers. After completing the repairs, they took off into the sky once more. As the sun began to set, Tony and Melissa stood before stars and stripes. Good work, you two. Let's call it a day. Today, I wanted you both to learn that helping people is the main focus of being a hero, not just battling. That's why I didn't let you fight anyone but me today. From what I saw, I'm confident you've learned that lesson well. Tomorrow, things will get a bit more intense as you'll truly start facing villains. Stars and Stripes gave them a final pat on the shoulder. Once again, you two were great out there. The people seemed to love you. With that, they said their goodbyes to stars and stripes before blasting off into the sky. She watched them go with her hands on her hips, a large smile on her face. As they flew through the air, Melissa said, I'm going to visit my dad before heading back home. I'll visit mine before doing the same, Tony agreed. I'll see you back home. Then, Melissa said, leaning in close and making a kissing sound as she tapped her helmet against his cheek. Bye, love you. Tony didn't even get a chance to say it back before Melissa's legs shifted into rocket thrusters, and she blasted off. Tony laughed, shaking his head as his own legs transformed into thrusters. He veered slightly to the right, away from Melissa, before turning invisible. When he arrived at his parents' backyard, Tony deployed giant thrusters to slow down, landing safely. His nanotech shifted back into his reactor, returning him to his regular clothes. The guards and maids in the backyard were startled at first, taking combat positions. But when they saw it was Tony, they relaxed. It's nice to see you again, young master. A guard by the door nodded toward Tony. Yo, Patrick, Tony said, giving the man a high five as he entered the house. The guard looked at his partner in confusion. My name is Daniel. Inside, Tony grabbed his sunglasses from his pocket and began searching for his parents eventually finding them in the kitchen. As he approached, he heard them talking and giggling in a lovey-dovey way, causing him to make a disgusted expression. When he peeked inside, he found Howard feeding Maria a chocolate-covered strawberry, which she happily ate while Baymax prepared more in the kitchen. Yuck, y'all do this when no one's looking, Tony asked, startling them with his presence. My God, Tony, you almost gave me a heart attack. Howard said, holding his chest. Maria wiped the chocolate from her lips with a napkin and approached him with open arms. Tony, she said happily, giving him a hug. Hello, mother dearest, Tony said, returning the hug with a few pats. With Howard, he simply exchanged a fist bump. Hey, I saw you on the news, Howard said with a smirk. I'm on the news? Tony asked curiously. Howard scoffed. When someone with our name does something... It's always on the news. Tony pulled out his phone and searched for his name, finding a headline that read, Genius philanthropist, master inventor, now an awesome hero? What could be next? Damn. It's only my first day in turning. Tony muttered. Howard chuckled, like I said. When someone with our name does anything, it's front page news. So why are you here? I thought you'd head home straight from your internship. Howard asked. Tony scoffed and risk mom being angry at me for not visiting while I'm nearby? 
Do I look like I have a death wish? Howard laughed loudly. Smart kid. Maria pouted slightly. I'm not that scary. Both Howard and Tony looked at her for a moment before twirling their hands side to side. Saying in unison, eh, they chuckled as Maria rolled her eyes. Anyway, are you staying for the night? She asked, changing the subject. Sorry, I can't. I have a commitment after this. Ah, Maria said sadly. At least eat something while you're here. You must be starving after your internship. And I won't take no for an answer, young man. Sure, Tony said, not minding. Good, Maria nodded. After eating, Tony said goodbye to his parents. I'll visit you guys tomorrow as well. After a final farewell hug, Tony flew back home through the night skies. Friday, where is Melissa currently? He asked. She's still spending time with her father, boss, Friday replied. All right then, send May Hatsum a message. We can begin her internship. Arrange a ride to pick her up since it's pretty late. Right away, boss, Friday said. It didn't take long for Tony to arrive home. As soon as he did, he headed to his lab to organize some things. Boss, your intern has arrived, Friday informed him. Tony went upstairs and opened the door to find May Hatsum standing there with an excited expression and a large suitcase in hand. Are you sure you're here to intern and not to move in? Tony asked with a chuckle as he helped her with her things. May giggled happily. These aren't just things. They're my babies that I hope to improve. I had a feeling, Tony said, amused. Anyway, come on in. Sorry for calling you over so late. May shook her head. It's fine. I know you have your own internship to worry about. I don't mind. Tony led May to his lab, and her eyes lit up with excitement. Oh, so this is where the baby making happens, May said, practically bouncing on her feet. What does this do? And that? Why is it shaped like that? Can you take that apart and put it back together so I can see how it's made? What's this made of? Why is it so shiny? What's the purpose of this? May darted around the lab, pointing at various gadgets and asking a million questions before Tony even had a chance to answer. Whoa, 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 slow down. Tony said, motioning for her to calm down. May rubbed the back of her head in embarrassment. Sorry, I just get really excited when it comes to stuff like this. I don't mind your enthusiasm, Tony assured her. Enthusiasm and inventing go hand in hand, so you have nothing to worry about. But you do need to slow down a bit. Let's start with the basics. May nodded eagerly and sat in an available chair, pulling out a notebook and pen from her luggage. First things first, Tony began, when dealing with support items, you need to focus on three key aspects. Functionality, looks, and portability. May wrote down functionality, looks, and portability, drawing an arrow towards them and writing important next to it. She then raised her hand. Yes, Tony asked. I understand why functionality and portability are important, May said with a serious expression, but why do looks matter? It shouldn't matter how my babies look as long as they work as intended. It's for your buyers, or in other words, the heroes, Tony explained. Heroes care deeply about how they appear to the public. They don't want to carry around items that make them look unreliable or, worse, like an idiot. And the public, the ones being saved, also care about how the hero looks. They want to feel confident in the person saving them, and appearance plays a part in that. I see, May said, nodding as she wrote it down. When Melissa arrived home, she didn't find Tony on the top floor. Friday, is Tony home? Yes, ma'am, he's down in his lab. Boom. Friday's words were interrupted by an explosion, startling Melissa. She rushed down to the lab to see black smoke rising toward the ceiling and Tony shouting. Damn it, May. I told you to do it slowly. There's no need to rush. I'm sorry. May cried out in apology. I got too excited when I was close to finishing and it exploded. Melissa blinked, trying to process the scene. Huh. She muttered to herself. Third person's POV. Huh. Melissa muttered, noticing the strange wording. From the pillar of smoke, both Tony and May emerged, fanning their hands in front of their faces, their expressions marked by awkwardness and their faces covered in black soot. Oh, hey, Melissa. Tony greeted awkwardly, spotting their unexpected audience. Howdy, 
May added with a two-finger salute, her usual cheerful expression undimmed despite the situation. Howdy to you too, Melissa replied with a smirk. Ah, I remember you now. You were that girl from the sports festival, she said, her face lighting up with realization. May had some at your service. May introduced herself with a wink. You really went and took her as your intern, didn't you? Melissa asked, still amused by the scene. Yeah, I thought it could be fun. There's no such thing as too many inventors in the world, Tony said with a shrug. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go clean off this accidental blackface situation. He grabbed a towel, tossing another one to May. Melissa just shook her head with a sigh. Well, you guys do you. I'll be busy with my own thing. As Melissa walked off to her section, Tony glanced over at May with a sigh of his own. You've got to stop being so impatient for success. Sure, getting things done quickly and efficiently is great, but sometimes taking your time and progressing step by step is just as important. Tony noticed May jotting down his words in her notebook, which made his lips twitch in exasperation. It's one thing to take notes, but it's another thing entirely to put them into practice. Wait, that wasn't for you to write down. Ugh. Whatever, Tony grumbled, finishing wiping his hands. Let's just get back to upgrading that jetpack of yours. May grinned cheerfully, nodding as she picked up her tools again. As Tony continued guiding her, a thought crossed his mind. Say, have you ever considered practicing archery? May paused, looking at Tony in confusion. No, why would I? All I really care about are my babies. I don't know. Sometimes I get these random ideas when I see someone's quirk. For you, archery or being a gunslinger popped into my head. May laughed. You're right. Those are random thoughts. But I can see why you'd think that about someone with my quirk. These zoom-in features my eyes have would be pretty handy if I were an archer. And you've got really steady hands from all those years of handling delicate machines. With your love for inventions, you could probably make arrows with all sorts of effects and abilities. Tony added, trailing off as they both suddenly froze. Slowly, they turned to look at each other, their eyes practically turning into stars as wide smiles spread across their faces. Do you suddenly have this urge to build a high-tech bow? Tony asked, excitement in his voice. Maybe with arrows that have really cool effects like one that turns into a strong capture net when launched, or one that freezes the target in place, May suggested, her mind racing with ideas. Or maybe soundwave arrows that emit a powerful sonic blast on impact, disorienting opponents with intense sound waves, Tony added. Or a heat-seeking arrow with a small thruster to boost its speed. May finished, both of them grinning from ear to ear as their inventive minds sparked with endless possibilities. Ooh, how about magnetic arrows? We could make them either attract or repel metal objects. The possibilities are incredible. Or an arrow that deploys a shield wherever you launch it. Like, if someone needs to be protected but you're too far away. No worries, boom. Shield arrows. An arrow made out of pure energy sounds kind of cool now that I'm thinking about it. It doesn't even need to be a specific type of energy either. An arrow made out of pure lightning. Invisible arrows so no one could see them coming. May whispered excitedly her fists near her mouth as her imagination ran wild. Meanwhile, Melissa, who had been listening to them bounce ideas off each other, couldn't help but chuckle. I see why he took an interest in her. Those two are so similar in their love for creating things, she thought. Melissa massaged her forehead as she heard the two of them cackling like mad scientists. First, we'll need to design a good, strong bow. The bow could have its own abilities and special powers. And we can't forget about the quiver. We could add electromagnetic connectors to the quiver and arrows, so even after firing, you'd be able to recall the arrows back to the quiver, Tony said with a serious expression. May nodded eagerly. I love it. Our baby will be beautiful. Hawkeye acquired. Tony inwardly celebrated before pausing for a moment. If I were to really form the Avengers, who would be who? Obviously, I'll be Iron Man. Melissa would be Thor. She already has the blonde hair and love for electricity. Momo. She'd be the resourceful fighter, aka Black Widow. And since I already told Deku about Captain America, well, what other choice do I have? I mean, Deku did take inspiration from him after I told him the story. 
that only leaves the Hulk. Ha! All Might would be the Hulk. He's got the buff form and even the skinny form. It's like Hulk and Banner. That's hilarious, Tony thought, trying to suppress his laughter as he focused on working on the bow. Tony shook his head, trying to suppress his amusement and focus on creating the arrow. All right, here's what I'm thinking about the bow. First things first, auto adjust draw weight. The bow could automatically adjust its draw weight to match your strength or the required power for a specific shot, allowing for precision in different situations. May nodded her head in understanding and gave her own two cents. An advanced stabilization system could reduce vibration and increase accuracy, ensuring that shots are more consistent and reliable. Good idea. Tony nodded and the two began throwing more ideas at each other until they finished the design of the bow together. Tony smiled towards May, all its creation to you. Eh, but wouldn't I mess it up? You saw how I did earlier, May said, scratching the back of her head a bit awkwardly. Where does this sudden self-consciousness come from? Tony asked with a raised brow. May then smiled back as she shook her head. Sorry, you're right. It's just that I didn't expect to fail last time. So when I did, it kind of threw me off a bit. But don't worry, I'll do it, she said, clearly excited to start. Third person's POV. May had her tongue sticking out the side of her mouth as she concentrated on assembling the white and blue bow in front of her. The bow sat atop a placeholder as she carefully pieced everything together. However, something was still missing, the string that was supposed to hold and shoot the arrows. When May finished, she lifted her goggles from her eyes and put her hands on her hips with a proud expression. She then playfully pretended to cry, wiping her eyes with her forearm. My baby looks so beautiful. I'm actually shedding tears of joy. Tony couldn't help but scoff in amusement, shaking his head. Anyway, here, he said, handing her a pair of pink-colored visors that matched her hair. These should protect your eyes and guard them just in case. They're actually connected to your bow and quiver, so you'll be able to summon them mentally with the neural transmitter. Not to mention, they should help you with your aim, calculating wind speed, aero trajectory, etc., etc., Tony explained, moving his hands in a circle as if to list all the features. Hee <laughs> hee, May giggled happily as she put the visors on. She grabbed the stringless bow, and as soon as her hands made contact with the handle, a light blue glowing string zapped into place. May pulled on the string and watched it snap back into place. She then stuck her tongue out to the side again, pulling back on the string while closing one eye and pretending to shoot an arrow into the distance. However, due to the neural transmitter, her thoughts became reality, and an arrow made of pure energy formed. Shocked, she accidentally released it. Luckily, Tony's nanobots swiftly emerged from his chest, covering his hand as he grabbed the arrow from behind her just as she released it. He squeezed it, causing it to dissipate with a sigh as the nanites then swam back into his reactor. Well, that could have been dangerous, Tony said in a teasing tone. May practically tossed the bow onto the desk alongside her visors, putting her hands behind her back and looking around nervously. Ah, I didn't mean for that to happen, she said apologetically. Someone could have gotten seriously hurt. It's all right. No one got hurt. And if they did, we have everything we need here to take care of it. But still, May said, sounding a bit down. Accidents happen. No one said inventing was ever safe. I can't tell you the number of times Melissa and I had a misfire or cut ourselves while creating something new. I'm sure you've had your own share of dangerous accidents, and I'm sure this won't be your last. I suppose you're right. So, shall we take these bad boys for a proper test run? Which, if you ask me, is the best part of any good invention, Tony said, raising an eyebrow as he handed her some protective gloves. May glanced at the bow once more, grabbed the visor, and put it back on. With a serious expression, she nodded. Tony and May stood in his training room, where flying targets floated around, some moving, some stationary. May pretended to be a skilled archer by taking a deep breath before aiming her bow straight ahead. Her demeanor shifted to one of focus as she began to draw the bow back, causing an arrow to form on the glowing string and within the circle in the middle. As she fully drew the bow, the strings emitted pulsating blue energy, charging the arrow. The longer she held the arrow back, the stronger and more powerful it became. May took careful aim at a target and released the arrow. It shot off like a beam, cutting through the air with power and precision. 
As it hit the target, it exploded into a blue burst, causing the hologram to flicker and reveal the true nature of the targets. Flying androids made of vibranium. The hit was registered as 10 points on a holographic display. Whoa, that was awesome. May celebrated. She then gave the bow a twist, causing it to change colors. The string turned red, and as she pulled back, an arrow made entirely of flames formed. May held it for a few seconds, causing the arrow to grow hotter. The air around it began to crackle, and the tip of the arrow even started to turn blue. May's eyes zoomed in on the farthest target, and with careful aim, she released the fiery arrow. It shot through the air like a missile made of fire, hitting its target with an explosive force. Excited, she flicked the bow two more times. One turn created an arrow made of cold energy, while the other generated one made of lightning. This bow is so cool, May exclaimed excitedly. Well, I'm glad you like it, Tony nodded with a satisfied grin. There's something great about satisfying a customer, eh? But wasn't I the one who made it? But who was it that designed it? Touché, May laughed. May let out a sigh and placed a hand on her hip. Phew, that was fun, she said, handing the bow and visor back to Tony. Tony looked at her, confused. What? Here, I already had my fun. Let's create more cool stuff, May said eagerly. Keep it. It's yours, Tony replied, waving it off. Think of it as a souvenir for working with a Stark. Really? May asked, taken aback. Yeah, what am I going to do with that? Tony shrugged. May beamed and hugged Tony. Thank you. Tony patted her arm. Speaking of souvenirs, he pulled out his phone, but before he could finish, his expression turned serious. You should go home now, eh? Are you kicking me out? Was the bow to let me down gently? Was it a farewell gift? Did I do something wrong? May asked, suddenly worried. Tony maintained his straight expression and flipped his phone toward her. May, it's 12 o'clock, midnight. You can come back tomorrow. Oh, May said, rubbing the back of her head and laughing awkwardly. Ha ha ha. That's so embarrassing. Ha ha ha. Tony just shook his head and rolled his eyes. Come on. I'll get you a ride home. May nodded and pressed a button on the bow's handle watching as it shrank into a small canister that she clipped to the side of her pants. Can I leave my stuff here since I'm coming back tomorrow? Yeah, I don't mind, Tony said as he arranged for her transportation home. Once May left, Tony returned to the lab. As he passed by Melissa, who was working on a mathematical equation, she muttered under her breath, Playboy, what? Tony began caught off guard. Hmm. Melissa turned to him, blinking exaggeratedly and tilting her head in mock confusion. Tony stared at her with a straight face as she continued to blink at him rapidly. Do you need something, Mr. Stark? Tony shook his head and started to walk away. First Momo, then Toru, now May. I wonder who's next. Melissa mumbled just loud enough for him to hear. Tony's shoulders slumped as he sighed. He placed both hands on his hips and looked up. Melissa, Melissa, Melissa blinked in confusion, not expecting that reaction. I'll give you five seconds to run, Tony said ominously. Why would I run? Melissa didn't even finish her sentence before bolting from her seat. When she glanced back, she saw Tony chasing after her. I thought you said five seconds? I lied. Ah. Melissa's screams echoed throughout the mansion. Third person's POV. The next day, Early in the morning, Tony and Melissa were seen flying through the skies at a blinding speed, far beyond what the natural human eye could follow. They flew all the way from Japan to America in a matter of minutes, coming to a halt as they arrived at a U.S. military airbase, where stars and stripes awaited them in her hero uniform. Good, you two arrived quickly. As heroes, arriving at the scene on time is crucial. Even a second's delay can mean lives lost, she said nodding in appreciation of their speed. I, I, Captain, Tony replied with a mock military salute. Stars and Stripes ignored his playful gesture and continued, We'll be starting right away with no delays. Today, you both will be dealing with combat situations, apprehending villains, and ensuring the safety of the public with minimal destruction to your surroundings. 
I'll be following closely behind as you handle any villains you encounter. I'll intervene if the situation becomes too dire or if I believe you're going too far. But don't worry, I won't be smothering you or telling you what to do. I'll offer advice here and there, coaching you on what you could have done better. But otherwise, I'll leave everything up to you. Aren't you putting a lot of trust in us by doing this? Melissa asked a bit apprehensive. Stars and Stripes nodded. You're right, I am. But as I said, what you two really need is experience. This is also a test. Make sure not to break the trust I'm placing in you, because it'll be much harder to earn it back. Now that I've talked long enough, it's time for some action. As they flew through the air, Tony took something from his forearm and handed it to Stars and Stripes. Here, he said casually. What's this? Stars and Stripes asked, pressing a button on the device, which projected a hologram showing an aerial view of them. You said you wanted to keep an eye on us, right? That's in case we fly too fast for you to keep up. The satellite will track us and show you what we're doing. Well, that's useful, she muttered. Melissa, I think it'll be better if we split up. That way we can cover more ground, Tony suggested. I was just thinking the same thing. We can save twice as many people twice as fast, Melissa agreed. The two of them barrel rolled away from each other, blasting off in different directions. The hologram stars and stripes was projecting split into two large screens, one showing Melissa and the other showing Tony. Now, it was Iron Man and the Iron Maiden on the move. All right, Friday, Iron Man said. Okay, Jarvis, Iron Maiden echoed. Show me some action, they both said simultaneously. On it, boss, Friday replied as Iron Man's HUD shifted rapidly in his vision. The closest activity to you is a villain and hero currently engaged in an altercation. The hero is struggling, and the civilians nearby are in danger, Friday informed him. Iron Man's nanites shifted as he blasted off. I'm on it. As Iron Man neared the scene, he could see the chaos unfolding below. A powerful villain was overpowering a local hero who was struggling to keep up. Civilians were trapped in the crossfire, panicking as debris flew around them. Friday, assess the situation, Iron Man commanded. The villain appears to be an elemental manipulator, capable of controlling fire. The hero is heavily outmatched. Civilians are trapped in a burning building, and the structure is about to collapse. Friday reported swiftly. Got it, Iron Man replied, his suit morphing instantly. Nanites flowed from his chest and arms, forming powerful water cannons on both forearms. Descending rapidly, Iron Man aimed his water cannons at the burning building, dousing the flames with precision. Within moments, the fire was under control, and the structure stabilized, giving the civilians inside a chance to escape. Exit now. Iron Man ordered the civilians through his external speakers. He directed his cannons at the villain next, blasting him with a high-pressure stream that threw him off balance. As the villain recovered and unleashed a massive fireball towards Iron Man, Iron Man's suit shifted again. A protective shield formed around him, absorbing the impact effortlessly. The Nanites reconfigured once more, creating a powerful sonic emitter on his left arm. With a swift motion, Iron Man fired a sonic blast that disoriented the villain, forcing him to the ground. Before the villain could react, Iron Man's Nanites formed energy cuffs that shot from his wrists, binding the villain tightly. Villain neutralized, Iron Man said, flying down to the trapped hero. He extended a hand, helping them up. You good? The hero nodded, still catching their breath. Thanks. I couldn't have held out much longer. No problem, Iron Man replied. Get those civilians to safety. As the hero led the civilians to safety, Iron Man's HUD flickered with a new alert. Another villain was causing havoc across town, and there were more civilians in danger. On to the next... Iron Man muttered, blasting off at full speed, his nanites already preparing for the next encounter. Ma'am, there appears to be a distress signal coming from an underwater submarine exploration. From the signal, it appears they have explored too deadly, and it's caving in Jarvis said showing her the location of the distress signal. I'm on it, Iron Maiden said as her own nanites shifted. Her suit adapted instantly, her nanites flowing over her body as she sped toward the ocean. Her armor morphed into a sleek, hydrodynamic form, 
perfect for underwater exploration. The thrusters on her back and feet realigned, becoming powerful jet propellers, allowing her to dive into the ocean at incredible speeds. Jarvis, give me a visual. Iron Maiden commanded as she neared the location. A holographic display appeared in her HUD, showing the underwater scene. The submarine was trapped deep below, surrounded by crumbling rocks and under immense pressure. The hull was starting to buckle, and the crew inside was running out of time. Structural integrity is failing. Estimated time to full collapse. Five minutes, Jarvis informed her calmly. Not on my watch, Iron Maiden replied, determination lacing her voice. She accelerated, cutting through the water like a torpedo. As she approached the submarine, her suit once again adapted, Nanites forming reinforced hydraulic arms equipped with cutting lasers and high-strength grappling hooks. Jarvis, calculate the best points to stabilize the structure, she ordered. Calculating points marked on your HUD, Jarvis responded. Iron Maiden quickly moved into position, the Nanite arms extending to latch onto the weak points of the submarine's hull. With precision, she activated the grappling hooks, anchoring the submarine to the rocky seabed to prevent further movement. Next, her cutting lasers came to life, slicing through the surrounding rock formations with surgical precision, creating a safe perimeter around the submarine. Debris that threatened to crush the vessel was swiftly moved aside by the hydraulic arms. Stabilization complete. Now for the extraction, Iron Maiden said, her voice calm yet focused. Her suit's nanites shifted once more, creating powerful thrusters and an energy barrier around the submarine. With a surge of power, Iron Maiden began lifting the submarine, propelling it upwards toward the surface, all while maintaining the protective barrier to shield it from the immense pressure of the deep ocean. As they ascended, the pressure began to lessen, and the submarine's hull slowly returned to normal. Within moments, they breached the surface, the submarine now safe and floating in calmer waters. Iron Maiden hovered above the submarine, her helmet retracting to reveal her relieved expression. Jarvis, signal the Coast Guard for extraction. The crew is safe. Signal sent. Ma'am, the Coast Guard is en route, Jarvis confirmed. As Iron Man soared through the skies, his HUD flickered with a new alert. Sir, there's an emergency beacon coming from an airborne commercial jet. It seems to be experiencing severe turbulence and is losing altitude rapidly. Reports indicate possible engine failure and panic on board, Friday informed him. Tony's eyes narrowed. Send me the coordinates. I'm on my way. The Nanites in his suit shifted, optimizing his thrusters for maximum speed. In seconds, he was a blur in the sky, streaking toward the distressed aircraft. As he approached, the scene grew clearer. The jet was plummeting fast, smoke trailing from one of its engines. Friday, give me a visual of the engine and interior status, Tony commanded. A live feed appeared on his HUD, showing the damaged engine. It was sparking dangerously, on the verge of a full-blown explosion. The interior feed showed passengers in a state of chaos, oxygen masks dangling uselessly as they braced for the worst. No time to waste, Tony muttered, his suit's nanites already morphing. The armor on his back expanded, forming powerful stabilizer wings to better control his descent as he approached the jet. His right arm shifted into a high-intensity cooling unit, while his left arm transformed into a precision repair tool equipped with welding capabilities. Let's cool this thing off, Tony said as he positioned himself beside the malfunctioning engine. He activated the cooling unit, releasing a concentrated stream of cryofluid that enveloped the engine, rapidly bringing down its temperature and extinguishing the sparks. With the immediate threat of explosion neutralized, Tony moved to the next step. His nanites reconfigured once more, forming a compact containment field around the damaged engine. This field acted as a temporary buffer, preventing any further mechanical failures. Engine stable for now, but we're not out of the woods yet, Tony said his mind already on the next problem, how to land the jet safely. Friday, connect to the jet's controls. We need to take over and guide this bird down, he instructed. Already on it, boss. I'm bypassing their systems now, Friday replied, taking control of the jet's navigation. 
Tony positioned himself under the jet, his stabilizer wings extending further. With a surge of power, he began pushing against the jet's descent, using his own thrusters to slow it down. Come on, big guy, stay with me, Tony grunted as the jet's speed gradually decreased. The ground was rushing up fast, but Tony's efforts were making a difference. The jet's descent became more controlled, and the panic inside began to subside as the passengers realized they might just survive this. Approaching the runway, Friday reported. Preparing for emergency landing procedures, Tony guided the jet toward the nearest airstrip, his suit straining under the effort. As they neared the ground, he angled the jet's nose up slightly, preparing for touchdown. The wheels hit the tarmac with a heavy thud, the jet skidding along the runway before coming to a shaky stop. Tony hovered above, watching as emergency crews rushed in to assist the passengers. He exhaled a breath he hadn't realized he was holding. Friday, any injuries reported? He asked. None so far, sir. It seems all passengers and crew are safe. Tony allowed himself a small smile. Good. Let's make sure the authorities have everything under control here. Then we'll head out. As the situation on the ground stabilized, Tony took one last look at the jet, satisfied that he had done his job. He turned and shot back into the sky, already anticipating the next challenge. As Iron Maiden streaked through the sky, her HUD displayed a new alert. Ma'am, there's a distress signal coming from a nearby city. Reports indicate a villain with a powerful quirk is causing widespread destruction. The situation is escalating rapidly, Jarvis reported. Got it. Show me the location, Melissa replied. The coordinates flashed on her HUD. Melissa adjusted her suit's thrusters for a rapid descent and shot toward the city. She arrived to find chaos. Buildings in ruins, debris scattered everywhere, and people fleeing in panic. The villain, a tall figure with an aura of intense heat surrounding him, was wreaking havoc, using his quirk to create massive fireballs and shockwaves. Iron Maiden landed gracefully on the street, her suit adapting instantly. The Nanites reconfigured her armor into a high-temperature-resistant alloy, and her suit's cooling systems activated to counteract the extreme heat. Jarvis, identify the villain and assess his abilities, Melissa commanded. Villain identified as Pyroclast. His quirk allows him to generate and manipulate intense heat and fire. He's also capable of creating shockwaves from thermal explosions, Jarvis explained. He appears to be targeting the central part of the city. Understood, Melissa said, focusing on the villain. I need a plan to neutralize him while minimizing collateral damage. Hyraclast noticed her arrival and unleashed a series of fireballs in her direction. Iron Maiden's suit deployed an energy shield, absorbing the fireball's impact and dispersing the heat. She countered with a series of rapid, calculated moves. Jarvis, let's test the limits of his quirk. Melissa said as her suit's nanites formed a series of high-velocity water cannons on her arms. She aimed them at Pyroclast, releasing a concentrated stream of high-pressure water to cool down his fiery aura. Pyroclast roared in frustration, intensifying his attacks. He unleashed a massive thermal shockwave that shook the ground, causing buildings to tremble. Iron Maiden's suit responded with a reinforced stabilizing field, absorbing the shockwave's impact. Jarvis, analyze the shockwave pattern and find a way to counter it. Analyzing now, Jarvis replied. Recommend deploying a counterwave emitter to neutralize the thermal shockwaves. Melissa activated the emitter, which generated a counterfrequency that dampened the impact of pyroclast shockwaves. The villain, momentarily thrown off balance, was now vulnerable. Iron Maiden seized the opportunity. Her suit's nanites formed an advanced, high-frequency energy net designed to disrupt and contain Pyroclast's quirk. She deployed the net, which enveloped the villain, suppressing his ability to generate heat and fire. Pyroclast struggled against the energy net, his attacks weakening as his quirk's influence diminished. Iron Maiden approached him, her suit's cooling systems working overtime to maintain a safe environment. It's over, Pyroclast. Surrender now, and you won't be harmed, Melissa said firmly. Pyroclast, realizing his quirk was effectively neutralized, finally relented. The energy net tightened, 
securing him in place. Emergency responders and heroes on the ground moved in to take him into custody. Melissa watched as the situation was brought under control. Her suit's nanites returned to their standard configuration, and she took a moment to check the surrounding area for any remaining threats or damage. Jarvis, any further issues? She asked. All threats neutralized. The city is safe. Emergency services are handling the aftermath, Jarvis confirmed. Iron Man soared through the city skyline, his HUD flashing with a new alert. Sir, there's a situation downtown. A villain named Quakewave is causing severe structural damage with his seismic quirk. Multiple buildings are at risk of collapse, and emergency services are struggling to contain the situation, Friday reported. Understood, Tony replied. Send me the location. Coordinates appeared on his HUD, and Tony adjusted his suit's thrusters for high-speed flight. He arrived at the scene to find Quake Wave, a muscular figure with seismic waves emanating from his hands, shaking the ground with powerful tremors. Buildings were crumbling, and the streets were filled with panicked civilians. I've got to act fast, Tony said, analyzing the situation. His nanites quickly reconfigured his suit for seismic stabilization. His suit sensors began to counter the tremors with stabilizing thrusters designed to absorb and neutralize seismic activity. Quake Wave spotted Tony and unleashed a series of intense tremors aimed directly at him. The ground buckled beneath the force of the seismic waves, sending debris flying. Iron Man activated his repulsors to hover above the shaking ground, using his thrusters to maintain stability. Friday, Calculate the seismic epicenter and identify any weak points in QuakeWave's attack. Calculating, Friday replied. The epicenter is concentrated around his hands. Disrupting his quirk's output may reduce the impact. Tony's suit transformed, his nanites forming advanced shockwave dampeners on his arms. He aimed at QuakeWave, sending out a controlled pulse of energy designed to counteract and neutralize the villain's seismic waves. The pulse collided with Quakewave's tremors, causing a temporary disruption in his quirk's effects. Quakewave stumbled, his power momentarily destabilized. Let's put an end to this, Tony said, engaging his suit's targeting systems. The Nanites reconfigured once more, forming a seismic nullification field around his suit. Iron Man swooped down, using the nullification field to absorb and counter the seismic shockwaves. He charged forward, aiming his repulsors at Quakewave's hands, creating a concentrated beam of energy that disrupted his quirk's control. Your powers are strong, but not invincible, Tony said as he approached Quakewave, who was now struggling to maintain his footing. The villain attempted to retaliate, but his seismic waves were now erratic and weak. Iron Man deployed a high-energy containment field, encasing Quakewave and suppressing his ability to generate further seismic activity. The containment field stabilized the area, preventing additional damage and allowing emergency services to start rescuing civilians and assessing the structural damage. Tony hovered above the scene, ensuring Quake Wave was securely contained. Friday, check on the status of the buildings and the civilians. The containment field is holding. Structural damage is significant but manageable. Emergency services are on site and conducting rescue operations, Friday reported. Tony watched as the emergency crews moved in to secure the area and assist the injured. He allowed himself a moment of relief before preparing for his next mission. All right, job well done, Tony said, turning his gaze toward the horizon. Time to see what's next. With that, Iron Man rocketed back into the sky, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Third person's POV. By the end of the day, Tony and Melissa stood before stars and stripes. Good work, you two, she said, her voice full of pride. Even when you were told to focus on taking down villains, you mainly concentrated on saving people. That's what a true hero does. I know for a fact that when the two of you become official heroes, you'll be great. I don't have a single doubt in my mind. She patted their heads affectionately, a gesture of approval and encouragement. Tony, always confident, muttered as he adjusted his hair. I'm great now, and I'm not even official. Stars and Stripes laughed heartily. Ha ha ha. You've sure got an ego, don't you? With a snap of his fingers and a playful wink, Tony responded. 
It's not ego. It's hard, cold facts. Melissa elbowed him in the side, earning a laugh from stars and stripes that echoed across the field. Anyway, stars said, regaining her composure, I expect you both here at the same time tomorrow. We'll continue what you were doing today, but I'll be joining you. Tony and Melissa nodded in agreement, said their goodbyes, and blasted off in different directions. Tony heading to spend time with his parents and Melissa with her dad. A few days earlier, in a bar back in Japan, three men sat around a dimly lit bar. Tamura Shigaraki, wearing a VR headset, was immersed in his own world, while Kurojiri calmly prepared a whiskey with a round ball of ice and handed it to the third man, Teo Seiki, who was concentrating on a small device in front of him. Thanks, Seiki muttered, taking a sip. Dude, this is awesome. I'm so glad we recruited you, Tamura exclaimed, his hands moving in front of him as he manipulated the VR controls, a wide grin on his face. Seiki scoffed in amusement, looking towards the TV screen next to him. He presented his gadget with a casual flourish. Here, I finished it. Tamura lifted the headset, his curiosity peaked. So, what did you make? A mental chip, Seiki explained, holding up the small device. For those Nomu things you've shown me, connect this to their brains, and you can program them to follow more sophisticated orders. With this, you'll be making the perfect soldiers who follow your commands to the letter. Hell, with this, they could even become expert fighters in seconds. A voice from the TV monitor cut in all for one. Tell me, can this thing be taken over by an outside source and used against us? Seiki shook his head confidently. No, nope, I've already made sure of that. This thing isn't connected to anything, so no one can hack it. Sure, if they find it, they can destroy it, but that's pretty standard for anything. All for one chuckled darkly. I suppose you're right, in more ways than one. He massaged his chin thoughtfully as his life support mask obscured his expression. Kurojiri, bring him to me. Kurojiri nodded, creating a portal with his mist. Seiki stood, gave a final glance around the bar, and stepped through with Kurojiri following close behind. Tamura, unconcerned, adjusted his headset and returned to his game. When Seiki arrived on the other side, he found himself face to face with all for one. Seiki couldn't help but mutter aloud, a life support machine? An idea suddenly struck all for one. Tell me, do you perhaps see ways to upgrade this thing? Seiki smirked, glancing around the room. I see ways to upgrade everything around here, all for one chuckled again. I believe my decision to have the boy recruit you was the right one. Don't you think so, doctor? From the shadows emerged a bald old man wearing thick, round glasses. He nodded in agreement with all for one's assessment. The old man approached Seiki, extending his hand for the device. Seiki handed it over carefully, watching as the doctor began to study it. All for one then beckoned Seiki closer. I'm sure that, with your resources in the underworld, you're already aware of who I am. Seiki nodded, his expression growing serious. Before, it was just a guess. But now, I'm 100% sure of who you are. All for one nodded in return. In that case, for you to help me out, you'll need some upgrades. Sure. Your quirk is great. Wonderful, even. But they would work better with some help. All for one stretched out his hand placing it on Seiki's head. A dark red aura began to emanate from all for one, and from his arm, two star-shaped energies. One yellow, one purple, flew rapidly and entered Seiki's body. As the yellow energy entered, Seiki clutched his head in pain. When the purple energy followed, arcs of purple electricity crackled around his body. Seiki fell to one knee, gasping for air as he held his head. What did you do? He demanded his voice strained. I've made you better, all for one replied, his voice calm and authoritative. I gave you two quirks that I believe are better suited for you than they are for me. The first quirk is called data storage. It allows you to store any and all information you've learned. As a side effect, it enhances your cognitive abilities. The second is electromagic. It gives you the ability to control electromagnetism, but that one will require practice. With your intellect, this quirk is more useful to you than it ever was to me. Although I prefer quirks that don't require mastery to wield, 
The hero who possessed this cork was too dangerous to let him keep it. So I took it for myself. Use it wisely, all for one advised. Seiki looked at his hands as electricity crackled around his fingers. The once purple electricity slowly began to shift, taking on a bluish hue that matched his hair and eyes. Asterisk oh. Asterisk all for one thought with interest. Asterisk the cork factor is adapting to him. Now isn't that interesting? Asterisk now then. All for one continued. His voice calm but commanding. For your job, you will be assisting the doctor with his work. You will tell him everything you need, and he will get it for you. Seiki, still marveling at the power coursing through him, responded, although I don't mind helping you out, I hope it isn't at the cost of me pursuing my revenge against Stark. Because if it is, I would happily return this gift you've given me. All for one laugh, a deep, knowing chuckle. Worry not. From what I have gathered, All Might and the Stark boy are quite close, not to mention his successor. Our goals align with each other, so you have nothing to worry about. Good, Seiki replied, his voice filled with dark intent. As long as I have my revenge, that's all that matters. He destroyed my legacy, so I will happily destroy his... His grin turned sinister, eyes flashing with electricity that intertwined with the gears turning in his eyes, driven by thoughts of vengeance. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa were back home after their second day interning with Stars and Stripes. Having just returned from spending time with their families, they now sat in their lab, eager to dive back into their work. So, shall we go over Mark 39? Tony asked, curiosity sparking in his eyes. Isn't May supposed to arrive any minute now? Melissa questioned, glancing at the clock, uncertain if they had enough time. Yeah. But this won't take long, Tony replied, waving off her concerns. We're just looking at the nanosuit's performance and what could be improved. Melissa shrugged, leaning back in her chair. If you say so, do you want to start? Sure. For starters, the suit responds incredibly quickly to mental commands. When May caused that misfire, I managed to cover my hand and catch the arrow in seconds. The reaction time is practically instantaneous. Melissa nodded thoughtfully. I have to say, I'm impressed with the energy converter you integrated into the suit. You based it off Momo's quirk, didn't you? Tony grinned. Yeah, I've been studying Momo's quirk for a few years now, and it really helped me out. The energy converter uses energy to create things, but instead of generating objects like Momo, it synthesizes chemical elements. With just a quick mental command, you can create practically anything you know, you could have designed an entire suit around that alone. The potential is insane, Melissa said, her tone filled with admiration. At least now, if we need to put out a fire, we won't need the suits with water tanks. We can just convert the energy into hydrogen and two oxygen, and problem solved. Tony's eyes widened as he stroked his chin in thought. Damn, I could make a whole hydrogen bomb with the energy converter. Melissa shot him a sharp look. Tony. Don't even think about it, he gave her a mischievous smile. But it could be useful, couldn't it? Useful for what? Killing us all? She retorted, crossing her arms and giving him a stern glare. All right, all right, no bombs. Tony replied with a hint of sadness. Melissa shook her head in exasperation until she heard Tony mutter under his breath. For now, moving on, Melissa said, eager to change the subject. We haven't really had anyone damage the suits, so we can't comment on their regenerative properties. And I say that's a good thing. If no one's been able to damage them, we must be doing a mighty good job. Tony replied with a grin. That I can agree with, Melissa nodded. Wait, can we revisit the energy converter for a moment? You mentioned making it into a standalone suit, and honestly, that's not a bad idea. A suit fully focused on the elemental aspect. What's the point? Don't we already have that in our nanotech suit? Melissa asked, raising an eyebrow. Yeah, but that suit is centered around nanotechnology with the converter as an added bonus. This one would be the opposite centered around the converter with the nanotech as the bonus. I'll call it Mark 40. The Elemental King suit. Mark 41, Melissa corrected. What? Mark 41? She repeated. I'm already working on the Mark 40 suit. 
I'm just ironing out some details, and I should be done by tomorrow. It's about something I've been researching and studying. This one's a milestone, so it deserves to be Mark 40, Melissa said proudly. All right then, it'll be Mark 41. And funnily enough, I already have an idea for Mark 42 as well, Tony said with a smirk. Already? We haven't even built Mark 40 or 41, and you're already thinking about Mark 42. Melissa shook her head. So, what's 42 about, then? That's going to be a surprise, just like your Mark 40. But I'll give you a hint. I got the idea after studying Toru's mutation in combination with something we use every day. Okay, now I'm interested, Melissa smiled. So, does this mark the end of our performance review? Although, we barely did any reviewing. Before Tony could respond, Friday interrupted their conversation. Boss, your intern has arrived. I guess that answers your question. Let her in, Friday. Have her meet us down here, Tony ordered. Sure thing, boss. Have fun, Melissa said sarcastically, spinning back to her seat with a satisfied grin. You seriously want to do this again? Tony asked with a straight face. Melissa began humming loudly, swaying side to side, pretending not to hear him. Jarvis, I'm going to need your help going over these equations to make sure they're correct. Of course, madam, Jarvis responded. Tony rolled his eyes as May popped up into their lab once more. Your favorite intern is here to learn some more. Let's make some babies. Woohoo. Snap, they all turned towards the sound and found Melissa holding a broken stylus. Oops. I guess I don't know my own strength anymore. Those were made using fortified metal, Tony thought. Hey, Melissa, May greeted with a charming smile and a wave. Ugh, now I feel guilty about getting mad. She's so innocent, Melissa thought to herself before greeting May back. All right, boss, what will your favorite intern learn today? May asked, practically glowing with excitement. What favorite intern? You're my only intern, Tony scoffed. And today, I'm going to teach you about internal structure, planning, energy efficiency, and much more. Yesterday was more of an introduction. Today is when the Rayall learning begins. May's eyes sparkled with anticipation as Tony pulled up a holographic display. Support items are all about enhancing a hero's abilities or compensating for their weaknesses. The trick is to make them intuitive and integrated seamlessly into their use. He swiped his hand, revealing various designs of support items. First, let's talk about internal structure and planning. Whether it's a simple grappling hook or a more complex exoskeleton, the internal structure is crucial. You have to consider how the item will be used, what kind of stress it'll undergo, and how to make it as efficient and effective as possible. Tony highlighted a design for a compact energy shield. Take this, for example. It's designed to deploy quickly and withstand heavy impacts. But it's not just about slapping on some strong material and calling it a day. The internal structure needs to distribute the force of an impact evenly to avoid weak points. That's where the planning comes in. May leaned in, fascinated. So, it's like making sure the item can handle stress without breaking or losing its functionality? Exactly, Tony said, pleased with her quick grasp. And then there's energy efficiency. A lot of support items rely on some form of energy, whether it's electricity, kinetic, or something else. You need to ensure that energy is used efficiently. Otherwise, the item might fail when it's needed the most. He pulled up a blueprint for a portable propulsion device. This little beauty uses kinetic energy to propel a hero in short bursts. The challenge is to make sure it provides enough power without draining too quickly. That's where material choices and design tweaks come in. May's mind was racing with ideas. So we need to think about the energy source, how it's stored and how it's used. Bingo, Tony said with a nod. And don't forget about user experience. A support item is no good if it's too complicated to use in the heat of battle. It needs to be intuitive, something a hero can activate or control without a second thought. He brought up a new design for a retractable grappling hook. This one, for instance, is designed to be operated with just a squeeze of a handle. Simple but effective. May grinned, already thinking of ways to improve it. Got it. So what's next? Next, we're going to take these designs and start prototyping, Tony said. You'll get hands-on with the process. 
tweaking designs, testing them out, and making improvements. This is where the real learning happens. May's eyes lit up with excitement. Yes, let's do this. Tony chuckled at her enthusiasm. All right, in turn, let's get to work. Third person's POV. After May went home, Tony decided to call it a night. He yawned, feeling the weight of the late hour. Melissa, you coming or what? He called out. Not tonight, unfortunately, she replied, her tone teasing, though her eyes were focused intently on her work. Tony froze, just staring at her. Ah, all right, but don't stay up too late. We still have the internship tomorrow. Aha, uh -huh. Melissa murmured, barely paying attention. Tony smiled, shaking his head. He knew exactly what it was like to be that absorbed in something. With that, he headed to his room, collapsed onto the bed, and was soon fast asleep. As he slept, Melissa glanced toward the lab's exit and whispered, So, Jarvis, is he asleep? Like a baby, madam, Jarvis confirmed. Good, Melissa nodded, then began darting around the lab. Although I said this was mainly my idea, it's something I came up with while reviewing some of Tony's files, particularly something called the PIM particles. Hey, Friday, do you know why Tony doesn't use it? I mean, his research is complete, isn't it? It's the potential and the consequences that worry the boss, Friday explained. He mentioned that the quantum realm is a place of undiscovered possibilities, where the tiniest mistake can get one killed or worse, trapped in the quantum realm forever. The boss wanted to be sure he was strong enough to face any danger the quantum realm might pose before using it. I see. Well, what I'm doing is a bit different. I've already done the research and ran it by Jarvis. Everything will go as planned. I hope, Melissa muttered nervously, then steeled her resolve. Jarvis, initiate the prototype schematics, she commanded, her fingers dancing over the console. Right away, madam, Jarvis responded as the holographic display materialized before her. Melissa's eyes narrowed with determination. Friday, bring up the PIM particles research. I want to cross-reference it with the new nanotech formula that's been developed. A series of equations, blueprints, and quantum data appeared, hovering in the air. She analyzed them, making quick adjustments and modifications. The combination of Tony's research and her innovations would push the boundaries of what their suits could do. As she worked, she couldn't help but feel a tinge of nervousness. She knew the risks. What she was about to do was uncharted territory, even for them. But the potential was too great to ignore. Jarvis, what are the odds this could go horribly wrong? Melissa asked, half-joking but with a hint of genuine concern. Based on the current data and simulations, the risk is minimal. However, the unpredictability of the quantum realm adds an element of uncertainty, Jarvis replied. Perfect, Melissa muttered with a small smile, more to herself than to the AI. Uncertainty was something she'd grown accustomed to. After all, innovation always came with risks. She continued working, assembling the suit piece by piece. Nanoparticles flowed like liquid metal, forming into sleek, lightweight armor. The integration of her added technology required meticulous precision, and Melissa's hands moved almost too quickly for the eye to follow. Friday, let's run a diagnostic on the quantum matrix I created, Melissa ordered, her voice steady despite the late hour. Running diagnostic, all systems are stable, but I would recommend caution with the first field test, Miss Shields, Friday advised. Noted, Melissa said, though the thrill of what she was about to accomplish outweighed her caution. Hours passed in what felt like minutes. When she finally stepped back to admire her work, the new suit gleamed under the lab's lights. It looked like any other Iron Man suit, but Melissa knew it was different. It now had the potential to phase through solid matter, slip through defenses, and turn the tide in any battle. All right, let's see what you can do, she whispered her exhaustion momentarily forgotten as she imagined the possibilities. Before she could second-guess herself, Melissa initiated the suit's startup sequence. The nanobots responded instantly, enveloping her in the advanced armor. She felt the familiar connection to the suit systems, but there was something new, a subtle hum of energy that signaled the presence of the quantum matrix. She took a deep breath. Friday, Jarvis, 
prepare for phase one. As the countdown began, Melissa couldn't help but glance toward Tony's room. He had no idea what she was up to, but she knew he would understand. This was what they did, pushing the limits, exploring the unknown, and facing the risks head on. Three, two, one. And with that, Melissa activated the quantum tunneling protocol. For a brief moment, she felt a strange sensation, like her entire body was vibrating at a molecular level. Then, with a quiet whoosh, she phased through the lab's reinforced wall, emerging on the other side and scathed. Her eyes widened in amazement. It worked. It actually worked. Ha 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 ha! She shouted, dancing around. Oh yeah, who's great? I am. Ooh, ooh, ooh. She couldn't wait to show Tony. But for now, she had a lot more testing to do. With a determined grin, Melissa turned and phased back through the wall, disappearing into the lab to continue her work. Tony was fast asleep, hugging his pillow with a bit of drool escaping from his lips, lightly snoring. From the ground in front of Tony's bed, a figure began to rise. It landed perfectly on the floor, and as the suit retracted, it revealed Melissa with a beaming smile. She went over and began shaking Tony awake. Huh? What? You suddenly want some action, you naughty girl? Tony mumbled, still distorted from sleep. Melissa rolled her eyes but kept smiling. Just wake up, you doofus. I have something to show you. I did it. I completed Mark 40. Melissa, for the love of God, couldn't this wait until morning? Tony groaned in annoyance. No, absolutely not. I had to show you now. Melissa, I love you with all my heart, but you're a pain in the ass, Tony replied, rubbing his eyes. Melissa pouted playfully. Are you coming or not? Yeah, yeah. Just give me a sec, Tony said, standing up with a yawn. You'd have to crack time travel for waking me up like this. He added, still cranky. It's better than time travel, Melissa said with a proud smile, causing Tony to freeze mid-yawn. Really, he asked, suddenly more awake. Well, no. But I might as well have, considering how much time we're going to save, she said confidently. Unable to contain her excitement any longer, Melissa smirked at Tony. I'll meet you down in the lab. Before Tony could ask any questions, the nanobots began to form rapidly over her body, creating a sleek, purple suit of armor. The material looked like vibranium, and attached to the suit was a darker purple cape or cloak of sorts. Just as Tony was about to inquire about the cape, Melissa began to sink through the floor, leaving him standing there with his mouth slightly agape. As she phased through the floor, Melissa caught a glimpse of Tony's shocked expression. Worth it, she thought, feeling smug about her surprise. Ah, what the hell just happened? Did I just get woken up by a wraith or something? Tony muttered to himself, still in shock. Third person's POV. Tony walked down to his lab where Melissa was waiting with an excited expression. In front of her floated a sleek, futuristic suit, its cape fluttering as if caught in a breeze despite the still air. So, tell me about it, Tony said, standing next to her with his arms crossed, examining the suit closely. Happily, Melissa beamed. You see, it all started when I was going through some files we made. One of them grabbed my attention, Tim Particles. It was the only file on the list I hadn't heard about before, and I've never heard you mention it. As I read it, I became fascinated with quantum physics. It was so interesting. So, I kept studying, and when I came across quantum tunneling, I thought it would be an interesting idea for a suit. Using the file as a base, I developed this device called the Quantum Matrix. It absorbs energy from the quantum realm and uses it to phase through walls and other solid objects. Coming up with the matrix was a task and a half. I had to work through so many equations to ensure it could properly harness quantum energy and use the tunneling effect. Harnessing quantum energy was tricky since there's so much of it. If not controlled, the device could explode, so that's where the cape comes in. It releases the extra energy that the suit can't harness, preventing it from imploding. I used unstable molecule fibers to make the cape since they're the only material that can adapt to the energy. And thanks to this, I discovered something else. Check this out. Melissa ran toward the suit, removed the cape, and threw it toward the wall. The cape stuck to the surface, 
and then Melissa ran straight at it, disappearing as she passed through. Her head peeked back out from the wall, and she grinned. Tada! The cape allows people to walk through walls too. Isn't that great? Tony gave her a few slow claps, nodding his head. Very impressive, Melissa. Melissa walked out fully and began bowing dramatically. Thank you. Thank. Friday. Restrict Melissa's access to my files, Tony ordered, his voice suddenly cold and expressionless. <laughs> Melissa froze mid-bow, her sentence cut off. As you wish, boss, Friday responded immediately. Wait, what's going on? What did I do wrong? Melissa asked, standing upright with a confused expression. Melissa, has it ever occurred to you why, even though I completed that project, I've never used it or made a suit for it? Erm, um, Friday said it was because the quantum realm is too unpredictable. It's dangerous, Melissa, Tony said, his tone growing more serious than she'd ever heard. She was taken aback, never having seen Tony so stern before. The laws of physics work very differently in the quantum realm. A single mistake on your part could have unimaginable consequences. You could have gotten radiation poisoning, killed yourself, or worse, you could have been trapped in the quantum realm for who knows how long. You could have spent your entire life in pure isolation, with not even a single second passing in the real world for me to know and rescue you. We always take risks when building new things, don't we? Melissa retorted, her excitement now turning into frustration. Now that I finally made something cool and awesome, it's suddenly a problem? Calculated risks. Melissa, we always take calculated risks. Tony snapped, his voice rising in anger. What part of the quantum realm is unpredictable, did you not understand? You can't calculate the unpredictable. Tears welled up in Melissa's eyes as she stood there, stunned. She had never seen Tony so angry, especially not at her. It pained Tony to see Melissa in tears, but he knew he had to be stern so she would understand why he was angry. If you wanted to dabble in something as dangerous as quantum science, you should have come to me. We could have done it together. Melissa looked down, wiping away her tears. I just wanted to surprise you. I wanted to show you that I could make something great. I wanted you to be proud of me. To show that I can stand by your side as a great inventor too, she said, tears rolling down her cheeks as she choked out a sob. Tony sighed, massaging his forehead and ruffling his hair in frustration. He walked up to Melissa and wrapped her in a hug as she silently cried in his arms. But I am proud of you, Melissa, Tony said softly. It's just, what you did was reckless. I understand you wanted to surprise me, but you put your life on the line. If you had made a device that let you pass through walls safely, that would be one thing. But you made a suit and immediately put it to use, not knowing the risks you were taking. Melissa held onto Tony, her arms wrapped tightly around him as she continued to cry. Please don't be mad at me. I'm sorry. Tony sighed, feeling the weight of his emotions. I'm sorry, but I can't help but be mad at you right now. I'm mad because I love you, Melissa. I hope you can understand that, he said, kissing the top of her head. God, I sound like an abusive boyfriend right now, Tony grumbled, shaking his head. Melissa giggled through her tears at his comment, shaking her head. No, I understand. I was in the wrong. She looked up at him, her face tear-stricken. I'm sorry, she whispered, biting her lips slightly. Tony sighed again, cupping her face in his hands as he began wiping away her tears. He scoffed, you should be, especially since you've made something so cool that I'm actually a bit jealous. I'm not gonna lie. So, you do think it's cool, right? She asked with a small smile, her eyes still red from crying. Kinda pisses me off that it's cooler than anything I've ever made. Tony admitted with a bit of an irritated expression. Melissa smirked slightly, feeling a bit smug. Heh, don't get a big head just yet. You're still restricted, Tony scoffed, his expression turning serious once again. Melissa, I want you to promise me that if you're ever going to mess with something so dangerous, you'll at least tell me so we can work on it together. You were very lucky that nothing went wrong this time, but you might not be so lucky the next. Melissa nodded as she leaned into his hand. All right, I promise. I'll be sure to consult with you next time, so we can do it together, 
Tony kissed her forehead and nodded. Good. Now, you'd better have made one for me as well. Melissa giggled and nodded. Of course I have. She walked over to her work desk and picked up a small device. Here, she said, tossing it to him like a small disc. Tony caught it with one hand, examining the golden disc. He pressed the middle button, and it dissolved around his fingers, rapidly morphing into a gold and white version of the suit over his body. A shiny gold cape shot out from behind him as he began to float in the air. It always does smell like a new car in these situations. Tony quipped with a smirk. Third person's POV. So, did you use Technovision to create the Quantum Matrix? Tony asked as he examined the suits, his gaze sharp with curiosity. Melissa hesitated for a moment, then nodded with a sheepish smile. Yeah, I did. Honestly, I couldn't have done it without it. Was that a bad call? Tony scoffed, shaking his head. Bad? You'd have been an idiot not to use it. Melissa relaxed slightly, but Tony was already shifting gears. Friday, what time is it? It's 4 a.m., boss, Friday replied. Tony rubbed his chin thoughtfully. Mark 42's the one I really want to dive into, but that's going to take too much time right now. Guess I'll focus on Mark 41, the Elemental King suit. I should be able to finish it in a few hours, just in time before we need to head out for our internship. Wait, we're not going back to bed? Melissa asked, her brow furrowing as she looked at Tony. Tony sighed, his tone carrying a hint of irritation. I can't since someone decided to wake me up. Might as well make use of the time. Melissa winced, looking at him apologetically. Sorry for waking you. Tony rolled his eyes but leaned in to kiss the side of her head. Go get some sleep. You've been up all night, you need the rest. I'll wake you when it's time to leave. Yeah. I am pretty tired, Melissa muttered. She sighed and gave him a quick peck on the lips before heading off to bed. Once she was gone, Tony got to work, his focus sharpening. Friday, I need you to gather all the research on neuroscience, especially anything related to emotions. And while you're at it, compile all the data we've gathered from studying Toru's quirk and any holographic tech we've come across. I want it all in one file for later. Tony smirked to himself. Let's call it the Lantern Project. As you wish, Boss Friday confirmed. Then she asked, And what would you like me to bring up now? Bring out the file on the energy converter. I want to see if there's a way to push this thing to its full potential, Tony said, settling into his seat. Instantly, a holographic file of the energy converter materialized before him, detailed schematics floating in midair. Tony leaned forward, fingers steepled as he scrutinized the hologram. I base this on everything I learned from Momo's quirk, how she taps into her energy reserves to create matter. Instead of creating things, I adapted the principle to convert energy directly into elements. It's brilliant, but without a deep understanding of chemistry, it's practically useless. But in the hands of someone as genius as I am, well, I fear for my enemies, Tony thought with a smirk, but he wasn't content. Ideas were already racing through his mind for improvements. Grabbing the energy converter from his workbench, Tony donned his technovision, his body more accustomed to the devices now. All right, Friday, let's start with modular element creation. Why limit ourselves to single elements when we could create specific compounds or alloys on the fly? Imagine synthesizing vibranium-titanium alloys in a heartbeat, or something even more exotic, like a spontaneously formed explosive compound. That's not just versatility. It's game-changing. He paused, eyes narrowing as he continued to scan the device. And let's optimize energy efficiency while we're at it. It's good now, but it could be better. Incorporate principles from the Stark reactor, minimal waste, maximum output. I want this thing running longer and hotter without burning through resources. Tony's hands moved rapidly across the holographic display from his Technovision, making adjustments. Elemental customization. If we're making elements, let's tweak the isotopic composition. Stable isotopes for construction? Check. Radioactive ones for offensive maneuvers? Double check. Give me the ability to decide the exact properties of the elements we're producing. 
This thing will be like having a chemistry lab in your pocket. He tapped a section of the schematic, bringing up more details. Advanced targeting systems. Let's not just create elements. Let's deploy them with precision. Whether it's dispersing gases in a controlled area, forming instant barriers, or generating weapons on the fly, I want pinpoint accuracy. We're talking smart deployment, adaptive responses based on the situation. Finally, Tony focused on the power core of the converter. Energy storage. Instead of just using energy, let's have this thing store and used energy in a specialized cell. If I don't need to create an element immediately, I want that energy banked ready when I do. Or better yet, share that energy with other systems. This thing could power a small city if we do it right. As Tony completed the upgrades, the converter hummed with newfound energy in his techno vision. Now that's more like it, he said, grinning with satisfaction. Friday, initiate the integration sequence. Let's see just how powerful we can make this. It shall be done, Friday responded. The nanobots in Tony's lab began to stir, moving around and assisting with the construction of the upgraded converter. The nanobots presented the finished converter, a round, glowing sphere with intricate designs and patterns embedded within it. It was far from an ordinary glowing ball. Now let's integrate it into a new suit. The nanotech will support the transformation and adapt it to fully utilize the converter, Tony muttered as he began working with the nanotech. When he finished, Tony stood before a suit of emerald and silver, which he instantly adapted to. He moved to his testing ground, extending his hand. His repulsor dust swirled, forming a circle that condensed into a ball and grew larger. When Tony fired it, a boulder of earth flew from his hand, crushing the targets in front of him. In his other hand, he generated a powerful blast of wind. With the new suit, Tony could manipulate practically any element by utilizing the correct periodic formulas. As he marveled at the suit's capabilities, a grin spread across his face. All right, let's push this a bit further, he said to himself. Friday, initiate the elemental sequence. Let's see how quickly I can cycle through different elements. It shall be done, Friday responded crisply. Tony extended his right hand, and within seconds, the repulsor energy transformed into a torrent of water, surging forward and carving a path through the rocky terrain. He snapped his fingers, and the water instantly turned to ice, freezing the ground solid. Not bad. Let's crank it up, Tony muttered, raising both hands. The ice shattered and melted, and as the water evaporated, intense heat radiated from his palms. Flames burst forth, swirling into a fiery vortex that engulfed the remaining targets. The suit adapted seamlessly. Tony focused, and the silver lines on his suit began to glow as the converter processed new commands. In a flash, energy condensed into a sphere of crackling electricity, which he hurled into the sky. The sphere exploded into a web of lightning that arced across the testing ground, striking targets in rapid succession. For the final test, Tony reached out with his right hand, focusing on a metallic structure in the distance. The suit hummed as it synchronized with his command. The structure disassembled into a cloud of floating metal fragments, which Tony manipulated with precision. He reassembled them into complex shapes before collapsing them back into a solid block. Well, that's a wrap, Tony said, retracting the nanobots and deactivating the converter. The suit handles the elemental shifts smoothly, and the integration with the converter is flawless. Indeed, sir, Friday confirmed. All tests have been completed successfully. The potential applications are vast. Tony smiled, already brainstorming new uses for the suit in the field. He then asked, All right, Friday, how much time has passed since I started working on this? Two hours have passed since you initially requested the time, Friday replied. I see. I still have about an hour of free time. Friday, have you received the information on the Lantern Project yet? It has already been prepared and is ready for your review. Shall I bring it forth? Friday asked. Yeah, I'll use the hour I have left to study it before I wake up Melissa. Tony said as he stepped out of his armor, which hovered slightly in place. Third person's POV. Tony was sitting with one leg over the other as he studied his latest project. 
Friday, do you think it's possible to connect a neural link to the emotional section of the brain? Like, for what I'm thinking of, a certain emotion would be able to power it or make it stronger. Boss, as you have previously stated, when it comes to inventions, anything is possible. Also, you haven't used the Technovision on the neural link specifically, you've used it for the things around it, so it could still be upgraded to what you desire and are looking for. Tony rubbed his chin thoughtfully. I suppose you're right, boss. It's time for you to wake up Miss Shields and be on your way to your internship. Friday reminded him. HM? Already? Tony sighed, putting everything away and heading upstairs to wake Melissa. After getting cleaned up and ready for the third day of their internship, they made their way to their lab. Melissa glanced at the Elemental King suit and smirked. I think I can confidently say mine's better. Shut up, will you? Tony replied, slightly irritated. Melissa couldn't help but laugh at his reaction. So, you'll be wearing your suit while I wear mine? No, I really like your suit. Tony admitted with a grumble, his shoulders slumping. Mark 41 is going to the storage. Melissa beamed with pride, seeing how much Tony liked her suit, even if it had caused some tension between them. Tony called forth a tiny disc from the table, which flew into his hand. He pressed a button, and it dissolved into a sleek white and gold suit. Melissa's suit, on the other hand, was black and purple. As they prepared to leave, Mark 41 flew out of the lab, ascending into space until it reached STELLA, where the station's mechanisms shifted to accommodate the suit's arrival. Meanwhile, Tony and Melissa soared through the sky towards America. They soon became intangible, eliminating wind resistance. Hey, I got an idea. Tony said with a mischievous smile. I'm all ears. Stars and stripes stood by the airspace, arms crossed, looking up at the sky, waiting for Tony and Melissa to appear. That's weird. They're always quite punctual. She muttered to herself. Oh, but we're already here. Wah, stars and stripes looked down, startled, and saw two white and dark figures slowly emerging from the ground. How? Stars and Stripes was stunned as she watched them float in the air, their capes fluttering behind them. Science, Melissa answered proudly. But of course, Stars and Stripes said with a smile, shaking her head. All right, so are you two ready? Seeing them nod, Stars and Stripes nodded back, and they began to work. As Tony and Melissa flew beside Stars and Stripes, Tony asked, So, what's the mission for today? Before stars and stripes could answer, as if the universe was listening, one of the pilots called out to her, we have a situation, star. Stars and stripes put a hand to her earpiece, listening intently as the pilot's voice crackled through the comms. We've detected multiple unauthorized missile launches from a remote military base in the Pacific. Intelligence indicates that several villains have taken over the facility. They're threatening to start a global conflict if their demands aren't met. Tony's eyes narrowed behind his mask. A rogue military base, huh? Any idea who's behind it? From the intel we've gathered, Star replied, it seems like a coalition of villains with military backgrounds. They've rigged the base with advanced weaponry and tech, possibly even some stolen Stark Industries designs. Melissa chimed in, they're likely planning to use the missiles as leverage to force governments into submission. If they launch even one, it could trigger a chain reaction leading to worldwide chaos. Stars and Stripes nodded, her expression serious. We've got to take out those missiles and neutralize the villains before they can do any more damage. The facility is heavily fortified, so this won't be easy. Oh, but it is. Due to the intangibility aspect of our current suits, we should be able to stealthy enter and take them down from the inside. We'll enter just like how we greeted up. It would be like our set of ambush, Tony explained. Very well. I'll join you, Star nodded towards Tony. She then put a hand by her chest. New order, I can make myself intangible on command. Melissa turned towards her and from behind her mask looked at her with a straight expression. You know, this is seriously unfair. I spent days trying to make these suits and you just go and have the same effects with just words. Star just looked at her with a smirk and didn't say anything else. As the trio neared the rogue military base, the fortified structure came into view a sprawling complex bristling with weaponry and surrounded by layers of security. They hovered just outside the perimeter, the thick, 
stormy clouds concealing their approach. Tony turned to stars and stripes. We'll need to move quickly. Once we're inside, you handle any resistance in the skies while Melissa and I disable the missiles and take down the villains. Stars and stripes nodded, her eyes already scanning the area for threats. Look at you already barking orders like a pro. Don't worry, I'll keep the air clear. You two focus on shutting down the base. Let's do this, Melissa said, her voice filled with determination. With a synchronized nod, the three heroes activated their intangibility, their forms shimmering as they phased through the walls of the base. The interior was a labyrinth of steel corridors and reinforced bunkers, filled with armed soldiers under the villain's command. But the heroes moved like ghosts, passing through walls and barriers undetected. They quickly reached the central control room, where a group of villains with various quirks were gathered around a massive console. The ringleader, a tall man with cybernetic enhancements, barked orders as his subordinates worked to arm the missiles. Stay alert, the ringleader shouted. We've got intel that heroes are on their way. They won't stop us from launching these missiles. Tony and Melissa exchanged a glance, and without a word, they initiated their attack. Melissa struck first, deactivating her intangibility just long enough to land a powerful punch on one of the villains, sending him crashing into the console. The others barely had time to react before Tony joined in, his suit's energy weapons firing precision blasts that incapacitated two more villains in an instant before they could even react. Where did they come from? One of the villains shouted, panic spreading as they realized their attackers were appearing and disappearing like phantoms. One villain, with a quirk that allowed him to create energy shields, tried to block Melissa's next strike, but she simply phased through his shield, her fist connecting with his jaw and knocking him out cold. Nice try, Melissa muttered as she continued her assault. Meanwhile, Tony moved towards the control console, his suit's interface connecting with the base's systems. As he began to hack into the missile controls, another villain with super speed charged at him. But before the villain could land a hit, Tony activated his intangibility, the attack passing harmlessly through him. Too slow, Tony quipped, phasing back to solid form just long enough to deliver a knockout punch that sent him flying rapidly through the air into the arms of another villain knocking them both down. In the air outside, stars and stripes faced off against several flying villains. They attacked with a variety of quirks, energy blasts, wind manipulation, and even acid projectiles, but she effortlessly phased through their attacks. Each time they tried to land a hit, she became intangible, reappearing to strike back with devastating force. Is that all you've got? Stars and Stripes taunted, her new order ability allowing her to shift between solid and intangible at will. With a powerful punch, she sent one villain crashing to the ground below, then turned her attention to the others. Inside the base, the situation was quickly turning in the hero's favor. Melissa continued to dispatch the remaining villains with precision strikes, while Tony worked furiously at the console. I've got control of the missiles, Tony announced. Just need to shut down the launch sequence. As he finished speaking, the ringleader snarled and activated his own quirk, which allowed him to generate electromagnetic pulses. He unleashed a powerful pulse aimed directly at Tony and Melissa, hoping to disable their suits. But Tony anticipated the move. He and Melissa phased out just in time, the pulse passing through them harmlessly. Before the ringleader could react, Tony solidified, grabbed him by the collar, and delivered a headbutt that crushed his face and knocked him out cold. Nice try, but you're out of your league, Tony said, letting the unconscious villain drop to the floor. Melissa quickly secured the rest of the villains, tying them up with high-tech restraints, which they always bring for the missions. All clear here, she said, looking around at the defeated enemies. Tony finished disabling the missile systems, ensuring they couldn't be launched. We're good to go. The missiles are neutralized, and these guys are down for the count. Stars and Stripes rejoined them, her uniform pristine despite the battle outside. Airspace is clear. The base is secure. Tony nodded. Nice work, everyone. Crisis averted. As they flew out of the base, leaving the captured villains for the authorities, Tony looked at his teammates with a satisfied grin. Not bad for a day's work. Third person's POV.
On the third day of his internship, a tense meeting took place in a bar. I see, so you were the ones responsible for the assault on UA, hero killer Stain said, his tongue hanging wildly from the corner of his mouth. And now you want me to join your little ragtag gang? He scoffed in disdain. Yes, because when it comes to being evil, well, you're a pro, Tomura responded, leaning against the bar with a casual smirk. Stain narrowed his eyes. Just what are you after? Tomura tilted his head, unfazed. Well, for starters, I want to kill All Might, but I also want to destroy the things I don't like. Tomura reached into his pocket, pulling out three photos and laying them out on the bar for Stain to see. They showed Tony Stark, Melissa Shield, and Izuku Midoriya. Stain studied the images, recognizing Tony and Melissa due to their social media presence but not Midoriya. He glared at Tamura. It's funny, really. You had my interest for a second. Until I realized something, his eyes turned cold. You're the kind of person I hate the most. Ha! Huh? Tamura looked at him in confusion. Stain reached for his knives, pulling them out slowly. To think I was seriously considering teaming up with a tantrum-throwing child. Bloodlust without conviction is meaningless. Kurojiri glanced at a nearby monitor. Sensei, should I intervene? From the monitor, all for one's voice replied, No, let this play out. There's no point in simply telling someone the answer. He must learn through experience. That's the essence of true education. Meanwhile, across the bar, Teo Seiki sat quietly, paying no attention to the drama unfolding around him. He was engrossed in reviewing the extensive notes and data compiled by the doctor over his long lifespan. His brow furrowed in thought. This is too much to handle on my own. I need help. An assistant, maybe. My data storage quirk is useful, but it's overwhelming. What I really need is an AI. With an AI, I could expedite my work and plans. Could even assist with my creations. After all, I've already helped modify some of the Nomu with my tech, so I should have enough free time. His musings were interrupted by a noise. He looked up to see Kurojiri with a cut on his arm, paralyzed, and Tamura pinned to the ground by stain. The hero killer had a knife pressed against Tamura's neck, with another lodged in his shoulder. To accomplish anything worthwhile, you need will and conviction, stain growled, pressing Tamura deeper into the ground. The weak will always be weeded out. It's only natural. Stain drove the knife deeper into Tamura's shoulder. Which is why you're going to die. Despite the pain, Tamura laughed. His voice strained. Ha ha ha. Ah, oh. Kurojiri, send him away. I I can't, Kurojiri stammered. I can't move because of his quirk. Stain, now lecturing, continued. The word hero has lost its original meaning in this corrupt society filled with fakes and frauds. Criminals who aimlessly throw their weight around are all targets. Poor Stain suddenly heard the hum of electricity charging up behind him. He felt the cold metal of a railgun press against the back of his head. Slowly turning, he saw Teo holding the weapon, blue electricity sparking from its coils. Careful, Stain. I prefer if you didn't kill him. I owe him for rescuing me, and he's agreed to help avenge something of mine. So... I need him in one piece. Stain chuckled, unfazed. So you're not just a nobody sitting in the corner. What a rookie mistake. It's all right, Teo, Tamura said, drawing Stain's attention back to him. No need to play hero. Are you sure? It doesn't look like you're handling it, Teo replied, raising an eyebrow. Just sit down. Teo eyed Tamura for a moment, then shrugged. He powered down the railgun shrinking it back into a handgun, and holstered it. Returning to his seat, he resumed studying, unbothered. Tamura turned back to Stain. As for you, hero killer, he sneered. You're aiming for my favorite arm. I'll kill you for that. In a swift motion, Tamura disintegrated the knife in his shoulder, the blade turning to dust. Stain recoiled slightly, surprised by his power. You talk a lot about will and conviction, Tamura continued, his voice low and menacing. I don't have anything as grand as conviction. But if I had to name what drives me, it's all might. A sinister grin spread across Tamura's face, his eyes gleaming with madness. The intensity of his gaze caused even Stain to shudder. 
that piece of garbage and the society that worships him, I want to crush them all into dust. You can think of that as my conviction. Stain swiftly leaped back, narrowly avoiding Tamura's swipe, his fingers inches away from decaying him. Tamura rose, scratching irritably around the wound Stain had inflicted. You've wounded me, hero killer, and we don't have a healer in our party just yet. So how about you take responsibility for that? Stain grinned, undeterred. You first. Our goals may be worlds apart, but toppling the status quo. That's where we align. Tamura sighed, clearly exasperated. Just go home already. Didn't you say I'm the type you despise? I was testing your sincerity, Stain replied, his voice low and calculated. People show their true nature in the face of death. You're an odd one, but I can sense something inside you. A twisted conviction. Still just a seed. I'm curious to see what it grows into. Stain smirked, the gleam in his eyes sinister. I'll deal with you properly once I see that bloom. Maybe it won't be too late by then. Deal with me? Tamura scoffed, rolling his shoulder. I can't say I want someone as messed up as you in my crew. Kirojiri interjected smoothly, Tamura Shigaraki. He adds the firepower we need. I'd say negotiations were successful. Ugh. Why couldn't we get a cooler swordsman? Tamura grumbled. Stain's expression darkened. We're done here. Send me back to Hosu. I've got unfinished business there. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Tamura muttered, glancing over his shoulder. Teo, you coming? Teo shook his head, gathering his things. No, I've got something important to handle. It'll be a game changer for us. Kurojiri, send me to him. With a flick of Kurojiri's hand, a warp gate opened, and Teo stepped through, his mind racing. This AI will be the key to avenging my legacy. It may not have been great, but it was mine. No one understands what it means to me, but I will stop at nothing to obliterate the Stark name. For this Avenger, I'll need a name. The portal closed behind him, and Teo found himself back in the doctor's lab. His lips curled into a cold smirk. I'll name it Ultron. Third person's POV. A fist made entirely of granite swung toward Iron Man's face, but instead of connecting, it passed right through him. The villain, whose quirk allowed him to transform into solid granite, looked momentarily confused. Seizing the opportunity, Iron Man retaliated with a swift headbutt. The impact staggered the villain, who clutched his face in pain. Before the granite villain could react, Iron Man phased through the ground. When the villain looked up, angry and ready for more, he was surprised to see that Iron Man had vanished. Spinning around in frustration, he was greeted by Iron Man midair. His leg arced, delivering a powerful kick that sent the villain crashing to the ground. Groaning in pain, the granite villain struggled to rise, but Iron Man was relentless. He planted his foot firmly on the villain and began stomping, his suit enhanced strength cracking the ground beneath them. Rubbles flew as each blow caused visible damage to the villain's durable body. Iron Man then aimed his repulsors at the downed villain and unleashed a blast, burying the villain deeper into the ground. The attack left the man dazed and stunned long enough for Tony to secure him with quirk nullification handcuffs. The villain's skin reverted back to normal as the cuffs took effect. Iron Man crouched down, flicked the man's forehead, and knocked him unconscious with ease. I'm done on my end, Tony said, tapping the side of his helmet as he looked down at the subdued villain. Same here. I think it's time to call it a day, Melissa replied with a nod. Agreed. We've been at this for almost nine hours now, Tony said, stretching slightly. Later, Tony and Melissa stood in front of Stars and Stripes. As always, great work, you two. See you tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you, they both replied, nodding before blasting off into the sky. So, as usual, meeting back at the lab after visiting our parents? Tony asked as they soared through the air. Yup. Melissa's words were cut off as Friday and Jarvis flashed a warning in their huds. Boss, the villains who attacked UA previously and rescued the Dark Forger have been spotted over Hosu, Friday reported. Tony's eyes narrowed as he immediately changed course, blasting off toward Japan without hesitation. 
Melissa followed close behind. Friday, text my mother. Let her know I won't be able to make lunch today, Tony said, accelerating toward the unfolding crisis. Earlier, as Midoriya walked beside Gran Torino, he listened intently to the veteran hero's instructions. Now that you've familiarized yourself with that black whip of yours, what you need now is hand-to-hand -hand combat experience. We'll take the bullet train to a safer part of Japan where you can start small and build yourself up from there, Gran Torino said firmly. Midoriya clenched and unclenched his hands, his mind drifting to the memory of the sports festival, of the strange dream he had after being knocked out. He recalled the sensation of being encased in the same black material as the black whip and seeing the other vestiges of one for all. When the bullet train arrived, Midoriya sat down, lost in thought about his training. Asterisk, I noticed that black whip responds to my emotions. In any situation, I have to maintain a clear head if I want to use it properly. But what about the other quirks stored within one for all? What are the requirements to unlock them? Mastery or adaptability? Asterisk Midoriya pondered as the train started moving. Suddenly, the side of the train exploded. Midoriya snapped out of his thoughts as debris flew everywhere. A hero was flung through the hole, crashing into the seats. His heart raced when a Nomu appeared at the breach, its grotesque form looming over the wreckage. Before Midoriya could react, Gran Torino tackled the Nomu out of the train and away from the civilians. Gran Torino! Midoriya yelled, standing at the edge of the hole. His eyes widened as he spotted black smoke rising in the distance. Asterisk Hosu City, that's where Ida is interning. Asterisk without hesitation, Midoriya activated full cowling, his body surging with energy. In a green blur, he shot out of the train and dashed toward Hosu. Arriving at the scene, Midoriya was greeted by chaos. Destruction lay in every direction, and the Nomis rampaging through the city seemed different, more mechanical. His eyes widened as he studied their cybernetic enhancements. Midoriya's gaze locked on a Nomu with a laser-like sword for a hand. It was poised to strike a hero from behind. Acting swiftly, Midoriya became a streak of green light, propelling himself toward the Nomu. He jumped and kneed the creature square in the jaw, enhancing his power with leg boosters that were built into his boots. It sent its head snapping to the side as it flew away from the hero. Midoriya spun in midair, shooting out his black whip to pull himself back toward the Nomu. His arm cocked back, glowing with green energy. With a single powerful punch, which were also enhanced with arm boosters, Midoriya slammed the Nomu ground, shattering the Nomu's cybernetic enhancements and sending its components scattering across the ground. Sliding to a stop, Midoriya caught his breath and looked around. Heroes were rushing in to contain the chaos. But then a chilling realization hit him. The hero killer, Ida's in danger. Without wasting another second, Midoriya took off in a blur, swinging through the air with his black whip, desperately searching for Ida. Midoriya's heart raced as he swung above the city, searching the dark alleys of Hosu for Ida. His eyes scanned frantically, and then he saw it, a horrifying sight. Ida was pinned to the ground, blood pouring from his wounds. Standing over him was Stain, the hero killer, sword raised and ready to deliver the fatal blow. Midoriya's instincts kicked in. Stay away from him, he shouted as he aimed his fist downwards, shooting his black whip toward Stain's sword. The whip coiled around the blade, and with a powerful yank, Midoriya disarmed Stain, pulling the sword from his grasp. In a flash, Midoriya shot two more black whips from his arms, latching onto the surrounding buildings. He pulled himself forward using full cowling, aiming a flying kick straight at Stain. Midoriya moved so fast that Stain barely had time to react, but his instincts kicked in just in time to cross his arms in defense. The impact sent Stain flying, crashing into the farthest wall of the alley. His body slammed against the stone, hard enough to make him cough up spit and bile. Stain collapsed face first onto the ground, groaning in pain. Midoriya landed in front of Ida, positioning himself in a defensive stance. Ida, are you alright? He asked, his voice filled with concern. Tears streamed down Ida's face as he struggled to respond. Midoriya, 
Midoriya glanced back at his friend with a reassuring smile. Don't worry, it's going to be alright. I'm here to save you. But in that moment of distraction, Midoriya failed to notice Stain pulling a knife from his belt. With a swift motion, Stain hurled the blade toward Midoriya. Midoriya heard the sharp whistle of the knife cutting through the air. He turned his head just in time, but not quickly enough. The blade grazed his cheek, drawing blood. Ugh. Midoriya winced, pressing a hand to his bleeding cheek. His eyes narrowed as he focused back on Stain, who was now kneeling, blood dripping from his nose. A twisted, sinister grin spread across Stain's face. Ida, can you move? Midoriya asked, his tone serious, his eyes never leaving Stain. I, I can't. I'm paralyzed. This is his quirk. He licked my blood from his sword, Ida explained, his voice strained and weak. Midoriya nodded, understanding the situation. All right, try to see if you can move even a little. When you can, take that man with you, he said, motioning toward the other paralyzed hero, who was slumped against the wall in traditional Indian clothing. I'll keep the hero killer distracted. Third person's POV. Tony's figure was a white and gold blur streaking across the sky, his thrusters and repulsors propelling him forward at blinding speed. As he approached the chaos, he activated his intangibility and entered Japan undetected. Melissa, you handle the gnomus on the ground. I'll take care of the perpetrators, Tony ordered through their comms. With a quick adjustment, he increased the output of the quantum tunneling tech in his suit, phasing him completely through the sunlight, rendering him invisible. He rapidly zeroed in on Hosu, where Tamura and Kirojiri stood atop a water tower, surveying the destruction they had unleashed. Tony slowed down as he neared them, aware that his previous velocity could kill on impact. Still invisible, he hovered silently beside Kirojiri. Calculating the precise timing and space in his mind, Tony undid the intangibility of his fist just as it connected with Kirojiri's jaw. Time seemed to slow as Kirojiri's face twisted from the impact, teeth flying out as his body was sent hurtling through the air, breaking the sound barrier. Tamura whipped around in shock, his eyes widening as he saw Tony floating behind him. Peekaboo! Bitch! Tony smirked, firing two repulsor beams from his palms. The blast struck Tamura, sending him tumbling through the air, completely out of control. As Tony closed in, a Nomu equipped with a powerful jetpack swooped in, snatching Tamura midfall. Hey, I didn't say to play fetch. Give him back. Tony taunted, immediately shooting off after the Nomu. His tone light, but his resolve deadly. Tony phased through the Nomu effortlessly, materializing directly in front of it. As he did, the Nomu opened its mouth wide, gathering a beam of red energy that crackled with intense concussive force. Tony quickly realized that simply phasing through the beam wouldn't solve the problem. If it hit someone on the ground, the damage would be catastrophic. Reacting swiftly, Tony fired two repulsor beams, meeting the concussive force head-on. The two streams of energy collided in mid-air, swirling together and lighting up the sky in a brilliant flash. The energy overload soon became too much, resulting in an explosion that sent a powerful shockwave rippling through the city, shattering windows in every direction. The Nomu used the shockwave to its advantage, propelling itself away with Tamura still in its grasp. Tony, unfazed, phased through the shockwave and shot forward, watching the Nomu's evasive maneuvers. Smart for a mindless brute, Tony thought, his eyes narrowing as the Nomu twisted and spun to dodge his repulsor blasts. But Tony wasn't giving up. He boosted himself forward, closing the distance, and when he got within range, unleashed a powerful uni-beam from his chest. The blast hit its mark, striking the Nomu's jetpack and causing it to malfunction, sending both the Nomu and Tamura plummeting toward the ground. With a sickening thud, the Nomu crashed into the sidewalk, still protecting Tamura in its arms. As it hit the ground, the force caused Tamura to roll out of the Nomu's grip and tumble into the streets. Groaning, Tamura struggled to his feet, clearly disoriented from the wild fall. A car, swerving to escape the chaos, nearly ran him over, but Tamura instinctively raised his hand. The moment his fingers made contact with the vehicle, 
it began to crumble into dust. The driver, a terrified woman, was thrown from the car, tumbling onto the pavement. Tony swooped down in an instant, catching the woman midfall and depositing her safely on the sidewalk. You! Tamura growled, pointing at Tony with bared teeth. What did you do to Kuro Jairi? The same thing I'm about to do to you. Knock your teeth out, Tony replied with a smirk. Without hesitation, Tony sent a burst of repulsor energy to propel himself forward at breakneck speed. His legs raised for a powerful kick aimed directly at Tamura. But Tamura, reacting in time, rolled out of the way, leaving Tony's kick to land hard on the asphalt, cracking the road and sending chunks of it flying. Are you trying to kill me or something? Tamura shouted, wide-eyed at the devastation caused by the missed attack. No, Tony grinned, his tone playful but dangerous. Just trying to break a bone or two. Maybe more. Melissa soared through the chaotic streets of Hosu, watching the destruction unfold beneath her. Nomu after Nomu rampaged through the city, tearing buildings apart and putting innocent lives in danger. One particular Nomu caught her attention, a grotesque creature with a blaster for a hand, unleashing devastating sonic blasts. Every shockwave sent cars flying and scattered the heroes attempting to stop it. She watched as the sonic Nomu aimed its attack downward, the blast's force causing vehicles and even people to be hurled skyward. Melissa gritted her teeth and flew in, catching a few of the falling civilians in midair, but she couldn't save everyone. Some hit the ground hard, injured and unable to get up. Before the Nomu could unleash another devastating attack, a massive wave of flames collided with its blaster, stopping the blast cold. Melissa turned and saw Endeavor, his flames burning brightly as he held the Nomu at bay. Taking advantage of the moment, Melissa phased between the fiery clashes, her body shifting into intangibility as she weaved through the chaos. She reappeared directly behind the Nomu and fired a uni beam from her chest piece, hitting the creature squarely in the back. The blast staggered it, disrupting its next sonic attack. Endeavor didn't miss a beat, intensifying his flames until the Nomu was fully engulfed, reducing it to ashes. Endeavor turned toward Melissa, his expression stern. You, you're not a hero, I know. Who are you? Before Melissa could respond, another Nomu came barreling down from the sky, guns blazing from its blaster arm appendages. Melissa quickly activated her thrusters, dodging the incoming fire, and shouted back, I'm the Iron Maiden. Remember it. With precision, she fired two repulsor beams that struck the Nomu's blasters, shattering them on impact. As she shot above the creature, Melissa unleashed a barrage of repulsor blasts from her hands and chest, each one connecting with the Nomu and sending it crashing into the street below, buried under rubble. Meanwhile, Kurojiri groaned in agony, lying in the crater where Tony's punch had sent him. His body was racked with pain, and his face ached with a sharp, blinding intensity. He lifted himself slightly, only to feel blood and broken teeth spill out from the mist that formed his face. My jaw, I think it's broken, Kurojiri thought, his mind hazy from the impact. What hit me? He knew that the only reason he had survived was due to his enhanced Nomu physiology. But even that was barely enough. The pain was almost unbearable, but something more important clawed at his thoughts. Tamura, he's in danger. With sheer willpower, Kurojiri tried to stand, only to collapse back into the crater. I need to help him. I can sense it. Knowing he couldn't face Tony or the heroes in his current state, Kurojiri stretched his hand out, his mind racing through possible solutions. We need backup. Something big. Something strong. A swirling purple mist began to form behind him, slowly expanding into a warp portal. Using the last of his strength, Kurojiri widened the portal as much as he could, his hand trembling. From the depths of the portal, a massive, black hand with only three fingers emerged, pushing through the gap. A singular, large eye followed, peering ominously into the chaos of the city. Backup had arrived. Third person's POV. You cheater. Aren't you supposed to be corkless? Armors aren't supposed to do that. I don't know what kind of enchantments you've got, but you're overgearing. 
You're nothing without that armor. Tamura shouted, pointing accusingly at Tony. Tony, unfazed by the rant, quietly gave a command to Friday. Without warning, he shot towards Tamura, his speed shocking everyone. As he got close, the armor suddenly opened up, and Tony leapt out mid-flight, fist already swinging. Tamura's head snapped to the side as the punch connected, sending him flying across the ground, tumbling uncontrollably. Tony landed with a smooth roll, immediately sprinting toward Tamura as Mark 40 soared back into the sky. Tamura staggered to his feet, spitting out blood. He wiped his mouth and smirked through the pain. They're all the same. Pride will always be the death of them. He charged at Tony, extending his hand, hoping to make contact. But as soon as his hand neared Tony, it was blocked effortlessly. Tony's fist slammed into Tamura's gut, making him gasp as spit flew from his mouth. Tony didn't relent. Left hook, right hook, each punch connected with Tamura's face, snapping his head side to side. Every time Tamura tried to counter, Tony was faster, dodging with ease or striking first. You know, Tony said between punches, smirking, as much as I love my armor. There's something incredibly satisfying about feeling my fist smash into that pizza crust you call a face. Why? Why can't I touch you? You don't have your armor. Tamura yelled, frustration boiling over. Tony laughed, getting into a martial arts stance, his movements fluid. You seriously think it's my armor that makes me great? In a blink, Tony dashed toward him again. News flash, Krusty the Clown. Tony fainted a punch, then swept Tamura's legs, making him collapse to his knees. With a quick leap, Tony stepped onto Tamura's shoulders and backflipped off of him. Tamura blinked in confusion as he heard a high-pitched whirring sound. He glanced up just in time to see a triangular device rapidly descending toward Tony. The device latched onto his back, and nanobots swarmed out, enveloping Tony in his armor within seconds. Tony landed on one knee, his fist planted on the ground. When he looked up, the nanobots finished forming around his face, his eyes glowing a sharp blue. I created everything that made me me, Tony said, his voice layered with both confidence and power. Before Tamura had a chance to react, Tony blasted him with repulsor beams, sending him crashing to the ground. Without hesitation, Tony flew toward him, his fist transforming into a battering ram. He swung down hard, knocking Tamura unconscious. Tony quickly secured him with cork nullification handcuffs and hoisted him over his shoulder. As Tony took off, he spotted a Nomu with wings. Before it could react, Tony raised his arm and fired two red and golden spheres. As they neared the Nomu, a rope of blue energy connected them wrapping around the creature and sending it plummeting to the ground. Ruer O'Hara air. Tony froze mid-air. What the hell was that, Friday, he asked. Friday displayed a video feed showing a massive black giant emerging from Kurojiri's warp portal. Well, shit, show me endeavor. Tony muttered as he rocketed off toward the source of the roar. Tony quickly located endeavor and tossed Tamura towards him. Here, he's the cause of all this. Keep him secure, Tony said. What the hell do you think you're doing? Endeavor snapped as he instinctively caught Tamura. I can't do my job if I have to carry this dead weight around. You're the number two hero, so keep him secured. Bye. Tony shouted as he blasted off toward the giant. Melissa, can you hear me? Loud and clear, I need you to rally all the heroes and evacuate the entire city. The further away, the better... Wouldn't it be better to call in Project Legion? Melissa suggested. Some of these heroes aren't capable of handling the Nomu, so it wouldn't be safe for them to escort people out. You're right. Let's do it. Tony agreed, seeing the towering cyclops in the distance, dwarfing most of the buildings. Friday, Jarvis, bring forth the Iron Legion. Both Tony and Melissa shouted as chaos erupted below. Up in space, STELLA and LUNA were orbiting quietly in the vastness of space. Their systems flashed red before they uncloaked, revealing their massive forms. The hatches for the armor cases began to open, and the eyes of each suit of armor glowed, signaling their activation. The armors crouched, 
then launched out of their holding bays, blasting off toward Earth. Around 80 suits of armor rocketed down through the atmosphere, their rapid descent causing them to catch fire as they entered the Earth's skies. Unaffected, the armors sped toward the ground. Endeavor looked down at Tamura in his arms. Confused, Todoroki, who was interning with his father, turned to him and explained, that was Stark. He's right. This guy caused all of this, the main villain behind the USJ attack. He was controlling the Nomu. And what the hell am I supposed to do with him? Endeavor growled in frustration. I think Stark gave him to you because you're the only hero here strong enough to keep him secured. He escaped last time, Todoroki reasoned. Burnin, a member of Endeavor's agency, glanced up at the sky, her brow furrowed. Uh, I don't mean to alarm anyone, but I think it might rain soon. Endeavor and the other heroes nearby looked up, only to freeze in shock. An army of Iron Man figures was descending from the sky. The Iron Legion immediately went to work. Some of the armors grouped together, bombarding Nomu with repulsor beams until they were incapacitated. Others rescued civilians trapped under debris, flying them to safety. A voice echoed through the air, please evacuate the war zone. I repeat, please evacuate the war zone. Your life may be in jeopardy. They watched as a blue Iron Man armor, equipped with water cannons, began extinguishing fires. You're all seeing the same thing I'm seeing, right? Vernon asked, her mouth slightly agape. These are all of Stark's armors. Todoroki muttered in amazement. Endeavor handed Tamura to Burnin. Here, keep him secure. He ordered before igniting his flames and blasting off toward the battlefield, not giving anyone a chance to respond. Meanwhile, as Tony arrived near the giant Cyclops, he gave Friday an order. I think it's time to finally test the Hulkbuster. We might need it for this one. Third person's POV. Once more in space, to the side of the STLLA, two large wings detached from their compartments. They pivoted midair and blasted off into Earth's atmosphere, breaking the sound barrier multiple times as they descended towards their destination. As the wings streaked across the sky, compartments opened, releasing massive pieces of armor. The parts began to assemble themselves, expanding and connecting as they flew over Japan. Piece by piece, the armor took shape, forming a giant, imposing structure. At its core, however, the suit remained empty, a colossal hollow shell soaring through the air, with the two large wings trailing behind it like silent sentinels. Meanwhile, on the ground, Tony Stark faced off against a raging cyclops. Its single eye began to glow ominously before unleashing a searing beam of pure heat. Without hesitation, Tony conjured up a shield, struggling to hold back the destructive force. The heat vision clashed violently with the shield, and Tony's legs transformed, forming a powerful thruster to help him resist the intense pressure. He couldn't afford to dodge. The civilians still hadn't escaped, and moving out of the way would mean exposing them to the deadly beam. The Cyclops roared in fury, increasing the power of its attack. The beam swelled in size, engulfing Tony's entire body and pushing him back as the pavement beneath him began to melt, turning into a molten pool of liquid from the unbearable heat. With a final, deafening roar, the Cyclops overpowered Tony, blasting him into the ground and burying him under the rubble of the streets. The intense heat finally subsided. Smoke billowed from the Cyclops' eye, and it momentarily shut it, shaking its head to recover. Suddenly, a massive object crashed down behind where Tony lay. It was his Hulkbuster armor. In one swift motion, Tony propelled himself upwards, landing on one knee, his fist hitting the ground with a resonating impact. As the Cyclops struggled to regain its focus, Tony stood tall, spreading his arms wide. The Hulkbuster armor reached down, scooping him up, and encased him perfectly within the hollow chest. As Tony slotted his arms and legs into the suit, nanobots surged across the Hulkbuster's surface, rapidly increasing its size and streamlining its design. The once massive armor now gleamed with a sleek, modern edge, ready to turn the tide of the battle. Tony began moving his arms and legs as if stretching, adjusting to the control of the massive Hulkbuster suit. 
the head of the armor rotated from shoulder to shoulder, mimicking the act of cracking a neck. Then Tony slammed his fists together repeatedly, the clanging of metal echoing through the air. This is every little boy's dream come true, Tony said with a grin. Time to see what this mecha can really do. With that, he charged toward the Cyclops. The Cyclops, seeing the incoming attack, roared and rushed at Tony. Both combatants drew back their fists and swung, meeting in the middle with a thunderous collision. The impact sent a massive shockwave rippling through the city. Windows shattered, cars were tossed into the air, and several nearby buildings crumbled under the force. Even the news helicopter recording the battle was knocked off balance, spiraling momentarily before regaining control. Realizing the destruction caused by just one punch, Tony quickly recalibrated his plan. He sidestepped the Cyclops next swing and surged forward, grabbing the beast in a powerful bear hug. Thrusters on the bottom of the Hulkbuster flared to life, expanding and roaring as Tony lifted off the ground, carrying the Cyclops into the sky. The Cyclops bellowed in rage, hammering its fists down on Tony's armor in an attempt to break free. When that didn't work, it dug its claws into the Hulkbuster's back, trying to rip it apart. But each time the armor tore, the nanobots quickly regenerated, sealing the damage before it could become critical. Friday, find me a safe place to drop this thing, Tony commanded, his eyes scanning the HUD. Friday quickly identified an empty field, far from any civilians. But before Tony could react, the Cyclops clasped its six fingers together and hammered down on him with a ferocious blow. His HUD flickered momentarily, and Tony struggled to maintain his grip. Thinking fast, Tony directed his nanobots to form a ring around the Cyclops' arms, binding them in place. His legs locked together as his thrusters roared to life again, breaking the sound barrier as they tore through the sky, visible air rings forming around the Hulkbuster. The Cyclops continued its relentless barrage, pounding away as Tony flew. But he soon reached the empty meadow and shot higher into the air before releasing the beast. As the Cyclops plummeted toward the ground, Tony's legs shifted into a massive hydraulic stamp. His arms morphed into booster cannons, propelling him downward at breakneck speed. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Tony shouted as he slammed down on the Cyclops, driving it into the earth. The impact created a massive earthquake, the ground rupturing and crumbling under the force of the blow, leaving the beast buried deep in the shattered landscape. Tony smirked down at the pit. Don't worry, I've already prepared the memorial services, he teased. But before he could finish, the Cyclops unleashed a sudden heat beam from below, blasting through the rubble and hitting Tony squarely, knocking him off his feet and sending him flying back. Ugh, me and my big mouth, Tony groaned as he steadied himself. The Cyclops dragged itself from the crater, its eye glowing with fury as it fired another heat beam. This time, Tony was ready. His arms transformed into massive railguns, electricity crackling as they charged up. He unleashed a powerful energy beam in response. The two beams collided with a massive explosion of force. The Cyclops was hurled backward, but Tony's feet transformed, anchoring him firmly to the ground. The battle wasn't over yet, but Tony was determined. Okay. Big guy, he muttered, round two. As the Cyclops stood back up, Tony blasted forward, transforming his arms into boosters and his legs into a giant stamp once again. The beast raised its arms to block, but the sheer force of the impact sent it sliding back, carving deep trenches into the earth. Tony quickly disengaged the stamp and shifted his legs back to normal, delivering a powerful kick that broke the Cyclops' guard leaving it wide open. Seizing the opportunity, Tony stomped down on the beast's feet, pinning it in place. Bay blade. Let it rip. Tony shouted as the middle section of his Hulkbuster armor began spinning like a top. His fists pummeled the Cyclops' face repeatedly in a blur of motion, each strike sending blood flying from the creature's mouth. The Cyclops, desperate to stop the barrage, thrust its arm out and halted the rotation. Tony quickly adapted, morphing his arms into restraints that locked the beast's arm in place. Before it could retaliate, Tony blasted into the air, 
performing a mid-air flip before slamming the Cyclops back down with a thunderous crash. The force of the impact caused the beast to cough up more blood. Tony released its arm, pinning the creature down with one hand, while his other arm morphed into a massive hydraulic press. Go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. Tony chanted as the press piston pounded the Cyclops' face with relentless speed. After a moment, Tony paused. Are you asleep yet? The Cyclops' face was bloodied and bruised beyond recognition, but its eyes began to glow ominously. Well, damn me, Tony muttered, then grinned. CK. He quickly transformed his hydraulic press into a cannon-like device, positioning it over the Cyclops' eyes just as it unleashed its heat vision. The cannon absorbed the incoming energy, funneling it directly into Tony's suit. His HUD lit up, showing his power level skyrocketing. Energy at 500%, Friday chimed in. Thanks for the gift, Tony quipped. Now here, have it back. He leaped into the air as his chest reactor expanded, charging up before unleashing an enormous energy beam. The blast engulfed the Cyclops completely, disintegrating the ground around it and sending shockwaves across the battlefield. When the smoke cleared and Tony landed back on the ground, he looked down at the beast. Its skin was covered in third-degree burns, and it lay unconscious in a massive, blackened crater. Now that's what I call a job well done, Tony said, dusting off his oversized Hulkbuster hands. Or should I say, extra crispy? Right, Friday? No. Okay. I'm sorry. Third person's POV. Tony spotted a news helicopter approaching, so he placed his foot on the down Cyclops and raised his giant fist to the sky. Inside the helicopter, the reporter narrated the scene. It appears Tony Stark has taken down the beast after flying it out of the city to minimize damage. At such a young age, he's already doing the work of pro heroes without even having a quirk. It seems we can expect great things from this rising hero. From Tony's arm, a chain made of nanobots materialized, wrapping around the Cyclops' body. With his powerful thrusters, Tony lifted off, heading back to the city with the Cyclops dangling beneath him. Friday, give me an update on the situation in Hosu, Tony ordered. Right away, boss. All of the Nomu have been taken down thanks to the combined efforts of the Iron Legion and Melissa Shield, who's been leading the charge. Izuka Midoriya has also successfully apprehended the hero Killer Stain and rescued Tenya Ida from danger. Casualties have been minimized, but we have a problem. He got away, didn't he? Tony muttered, his face darkening. It appears so, Friday confirmed. Endeavor chased after you, leaving the captured villain to his sidekicks. Unfortunately, he was taken by hands reaching through a warp portal before they could react. Tony sighed, then smirked. Looks like my plan worked. Forgive my programmed curiosity, but what plan, boss? Friday asked, intrigued. The quirk nullification cuffs I placed on Shigaraki. They have a hidden tracker. I gave Tamura to Endeavor because I knew he'd botch the job and let Kurojiri rescue him. Now we can track them to their hideout, Tony explained. So you based your plan on the failure of the number two hero. What if he hadn't failed? Friday asked, puzzled. Then we'd have captured a major villain. It was a win-win, no matter what happened. Come on, Friday, you should know me by now. I don't do anything unless it benefits me in the long run. As the city came into view, Tony accelerated, arriving in mere seconds. As he touched down, Endeavor appeared, floating above with arms crossed and a scowl on his face. You, what do you think you're doing? Playing hero could have caused even more harm. You should have left it to the pros. I did leave it to the pros and look where that got us. Shigaraki escaped. I handed him over to you and now, because of your ego, if more people die, that's on you, Tony shot back, setting down the Cyclops. What? He hadn't escaped. I left him with my agency's sidekicks. Endeavor replied, shocked. And I left him with you because you were the only one who could stop his escape. Great job, number two. Now everyone knows why you're stuck at second place. Tony said as his Hulkbuster armor opened, allowing him to step out. Endeavor's flames flared with his rising anger. The heat around him intensified as he glared at Tony. Listen, 
Tony continued dismissively, Can you go be useless somewhere else? I'm in the middle of something. If you head that way, you'll find stain. You can take credit for someone else's work and boost your popularity or something. You think just because you have these fancy toys, you understand what it means to be a hero? You've shown nothing but arrogance since we first spoke. If you don't learn some humility, Tony ignored him completely, turning away. Friday, recall the Iron Legion. Great job with them. And store the Hulkbuster too. Endeavor clenched his jaw in frustration, but realizing it was pointless to argue with Tony, he let out a blast of fire and flew off toward the direction Tony had mentioned, searching for stain. As the two wing containers for the Hulkbuster appeared above them, the nanobots swam away from the Hulkbuster and back into Tony's armor. The Hulkbuster began to dismantle itself and store away inside the containers before blasting off into the sky. In the midst of it all, the Iron Legion followed, blasting through the atmosphere and back into space, where they positioned themselves, ready for another mission. Melissa appeared next, landing in front of Tony on one knee with her fist to the ground. As she landed, her mask retracted, and Tony's did the same. Melissa stood up and gave Tony a tight hug, and Tony hugged her back. It seems this has affected you more than we expected. Tony muttered softly. Melissa nodded in confirmation. It was awful seeing all those injured people. Tony kissed the top of Melissa's head. Well, I hope you find comfort in knowing you helped in every way you could, and thus the Hosu incident came to an end. In a hospital ward, Tony poked his head inside a hospital room, finding Ida in bed with Deku sitting beside him. Hello, hello, I've come to visit, Tony said cheerfully. Tony, what are you doing here? Deku exclaimed. I'm the class president. It's kind of my job to check on misbehaving students in my class, Tony teased, glancing at Ida, who winced at being called a misbehaving student. Where's Melissa? It's weird not seeing you two together. Deku asked with a small, awkward smile. Home, resting and taking care of my intern while I'm on business. I brought you a gift basket, Tony said, entering with a gift basket and sitting down on the edge of Ida's bed. In turn, Ida asked confused. May Hatsum, Tony replied. Ah, Ida nodded in understanding, sort of. So, you got your butt handed to you? Tony said, hands on his hips. Ida looked down in shame, and Deku tried to de-escalate the situation. Just then, Gran Torino opened the door, entering with the police chief and Mr. Manuel. The hero Ida had chosen to intern under in his quest to find hero Killer Stain and seek revenge. Gran Torino and Mr. Manuel, both Deku and Ida exclaimed simultaneously. Gran Torino glanced at Deku with narrowed eyes. I'm still going to chew you out, kid. But before that, you have a visitor, he said, motioning towards the police chief. H.M., I didn't expect to see you here, Mr. Stark. The chief of police, Kenji Tsurigami, nodded toward Tony. This is Kenji Tsurigami, Hosu's chief of police, Gran Torino introduced. Actually, I'm glad you're here, Mr. Stark, as this pertains to you as well, the chief said with a serious expression. Me? What did I do? Tony asked, looking confused. I'm just going to pretend you didn't really ask me that. The chief sighed, shaking his head in exasperation. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.